I have always made bad choices in life. Bad choices when it comes to friends, bad choices when it comes to cars, bad choices when it comes to restaurants. I can't count the times I've gotten food poisoning. You would think I would just learn my lesson and stop eating out. My latest series of bad choices landed me a job. I don't want to recall what got me here, but I'm a mailman now. My uniform arrived in the mail. It's a soft blue color that's dark gray and yet a light tone at once. It's pretty comfy and they tossed in a nice bomber style jacket. Having a job handed to you might be a nice thing, I should be thankful, but this job was dangerous and I would die if I refused it. I was standing in front of an office building where I had been told my training would be held. A blank swipe card to get inside the building came with my uniform. I was pacing putting off going inside, even though the morning was chilly, I was sweating. I did not want to go inside. I did not want to start this job, though. I feared what would happen to me if I ditched. Gathering all my courage, I swiped the card and went through the now unlocked door. Regret filled my chest when the door closed, locking behind me. The room I was standing inside was pretty bare, off-white walls and off-white carpet. Fluorescent lights hummed away above. The room was empty aside from a woman sitting at a fold-out table. She didn't even look up to greet me, she just kept her eyes glued to a magazine she flipped through looking very bored. I walked up to her, sweat still sticking my shirt to my back. She still didn't look at me, instead she sat, chin in her hand, snapping at her gum. I... uh... I started, then found it suddenly impossible to speak. Her eyes darted up at me and I took a step back in spite of myself. She looked like a pretty receptionist you could find anywhere. Aside from her yellow eyes and a mouth that was far too long for her face. Your partner is going to be here in a second. Got any smokes? She asked me in a raspy voice. I shook my head and she lost any interest in me. I was hired as a mailman, but if I was a normal mailman, I would only have to worry about bad road conditions and mean dogs. This was not at all a normal job. The mail I was going to deliver was going to supernatural creatures. I know it's a silly idea. I guess Bigfoot gets mail sometimes. Who knew? Knock, knock. I raised my head to the voice and the knocking sound on the other side of the room. A door I hadn't noticed yet opened, and out peeked the head of who I thought to be my new work partner. I kind of didn't like the person who would cheerfully say knock, knock before opening a door. This guy might be too much for me to handle. He didn't notice from my frown, and he smiled over to us. He was wearing the same uniform as me, but it fit much differently. He was at least seven feet tall and built like a tank. He covered the distance to us quickly, taking my hand in both of his in an excited shake. His kind, smiling face did not at all match the intimidating body of his. While he shook my hand, I could not take my eyes off the top of his head. I had to strain my neck to see, but my mind refused to process it. This big, strong man had dog ears. Fluffy, sandy, brown dog ears standing up on the top of his head. Scruffy hair covered where normal human ears should be. I finally tore my eyes away to notice other details about him. The mental shock of seeing such cute ears on a tall buff man made me not notice his legs. His uniform pants had been rolled up to the knee to accommodate dog-shaped legs. They were covered in the same sandy brown fur of his ears. His paws had claws that looked big and sharp enough to cut bricks in half, so not as cute as his ears. His teeth also looked terribly sharp. His hands were human enough, but his nails ended in claws. He was being very careful not to nick me during our handshake. I knew my new co-worker wasn't going to be human, but I wasn't expecting, well, this. You're a, a dog? I asked, not being able to stop myself. What's a dog? His smile never faded and he looked so honest in his question I almost laughed. The woman snapped her gum so loudly it made both of us look at her and then get down to business. Or at least try to. I'm... My partner said his name, but because he wasn't human, his name was not meant for humans to say. It sounded like a garble of growls and after a few minutes of me trying to repeat it, we realized it just wasn't possible. Rufus, the woman said, not looking up at us. 
Oh, right. My human name is Rufus. You're Toby, right? I'm glad to be working with you. Rufus said with a big smile. If his teeth weren't so sharp, it would be a nice expression. His type is the one of only kind that is alright working with humans. Here, you need to deliver this letter to Mr. Chatter. As she spoke, she took a red envelope from under her magazine for Rufus to take. The tall man thanked her and safely tucked the envelope away into his jacket. He was ready to go. I wasn't. I was still a little confused about the whole thing. Rufus noticed my expression and smiled again, trying to look friendly. We're going through the maze today. He started. The maze? I asked slowly. To get ready for my odd job, I had spent the last couple weeks reading up on cryptids, supernatural things, and any other kind of information along those lines. I didn't believe in most of it, but with a dog man in front of me, I should really start reconsidering what I believed. In those hours of looking, I didn't come across anything called the maze before. How to describe it, it's, um, a lot of the same rooms. It has two floors, so to speak. The light floor that is just a bunch of rooms and hallways and the dark second floor. I think different versions of this place appear for different people, but we're going to an easy, safer version of it. We'll be sticking to the first floor because you are human, the maze may be tough on you. Your uniform protects you from most things. The monsters on the first floor won't attack you or really be able to see you. Mr. Chatter is on the first floor. He might look scary, but is really friendly. Oh, right, you're human, so maybe not. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is you shouldn't worry because we're mailmen. The whole don't shoot the messenger applies to us. I know Rufus was trying to be friendly and ease my worries about my new job and where we were going, and I had been pretty stressed about the whole thing. The small amount I heard where we were headed, I didn't like it at all. I should be really worrying about what fresh hell I was walking into, however, I got distracted. Rufus turned a little when he was speaking, and I caught a glimpse of it. He had a tail. I couldn't handle that. It was a curved, fluffy thing that was too damn cute. I wanted to scream. This man looked like he could eat a tank for breakfast and he had the nerve to have a cute, fluffy tail. I could not deal with the juxtaposition of his tough appearance and cute tail. Pick one or the other. You, you can't have both. I hated it. He misread my expression as still being worried. He slapped a large, comforting hand on my shoulder and laughed. <laughs> You'll do fine. With my nose, we won't get lost. Just don't interact with any other humans you find lost inside. Your job is to deliver mail, not to save humans. We get in a lot of trouble if we go outside our job duties, but you're doing great already. You already took one step inside the maze, so what's a few more? I nearly jumped and looked around the empty room. It felt odd. Even so, I didn't think I had walked into a supernatural area. This is part of the maze? I asked, still looking around. We call them zero rooms. It's a neutral area for meetings. They can be controlled when they appear and who can be allowed inside. It's pretty neat. I didn't share Rufus's excitement. I guess he was right. I had already taken a few steps into this world and had a big man to protect me. Human or not, I might be alright. I followed behind Rufus into the door on the other side of the room. Before we left, Rufus turned to address the woman behind us. Please pick up some eggs for dinner tonight, he called out to her. When I looked at him, confused, he gave me a kind smile. He's my daughter, third marriage. I did a triple take. Those two couldn't possibly be related. I didn't have time to ask about it we were through the door and inside the so-called maze. All my fear came back and crashing down. The place looked very much like a bigger version of the room we had been inside moments before. I turned to look behind us, seeing the door we came inside had disappeared. No turning back now. The first few rooms I could see into had the same off-white wallpaper, where the floor was hardwood someone dumped white paint over. It looked like the rooms just kept going, but a few rooms in, the poorly painted wood turned into carpet. I followed behind my new co-worker, looking around, straining to hear anything. I thought creatures would be around, and I really didn't want to run into them protected by my uniform or not. I suddenly wondered what that meant. The fabric really didn't feel extra durable or thick. I didn't think it would save me if anything with claws decided to make me a meal. I decided to ask a little more about the job I had been forced into. So, uh, how do these uniforms work? Oh, 
Rufus looked over at me with his friendly face. This guy really was like an excited dog. But they're really special. I don't understand how the process of how they're made, but I heard each has some of the Silver King's hair in it, so it's like super tough. Uh, what's a good example for a human? Like a bulletproof vest? If you were shot, you won't even feel it. It also keeps some lesser creatures that would do you harm from even being able to see you. That doesn't mean you're invincible though. There are some creatures that can tear through the uniforms, but it's your first day. You won't come across them. I hope. The last bit was said so softly I almost didn't hear him. I had met the Silver King, and he was the reason why I stuck with this damn job, but he was a big deal in the supernatural world. It was a bad idea to drop his name, and I really didn't want to think back to how we met. I sort of understood how the uniforms worked now, even with the comforting idea of a god-level bulletproof vest, I was still scared walking around the horrible place we were in. As we walked, I saw that the walls had marked spots messages from people who had gotten lost. They used whatever they could to write them, from what I guessed was nail polish to scratching away at the wallpaper. I hadn't heard any signs of life beyond the carpet-muffled sound of our own footsteps and, without any other noise to cover it, the oddly disconcerting hum of the lights above. Rufus clearly knew where he was going even though everything looked the same. But as we kept walking, I started to see more messages and stains on the ground I feared was dried blood. I didn't want to think about who, or what, left those stains behind. I stopped in front of one wall with frantic writing in a faded sharpie. It was a name and address. That was all. I don't know why it got me to stop. There were plenty of names written, and we passed by many old pleas for help. I couldn't help but wonder about the people who had died here, or who was still lost, and their loved ones who were waiting for them to come home. I had my phone in my pocket. Without realizing, I had taken it out to take a photo of the message I was staring at. It's best if you don't. I froze when I heard Rufus speak. There was sudden tension between us. He was telling the truth. It's best if I don't let myself go down the route of trying to find what was lost. Nothing good could come of it. I turned off my phone and returned it to my pocket. I think he felt bad for making it awkward. He kept darting his eyes back at me, clearly trying to think of something to say. You know, things have changed a lot since I last came by. Because this place adjusts to humans' expectations, it's never the same twice. Two people could be right next to each other but seeing something different. The last time I was here it smelled so much of chemicals and bleach, it was hard to get around, but now it's pretty nice. I can understand why creatures have been moving here recently. Lots of space. Free food. Rufus was trying to fill the silence by chatting away. When he mentioned the free food part, he gestured to a stand on the floor we had just walked by. We had been walking by an increasing amount of them. The one he nodded his head towards looked fresher than the others had. I looked up at him, face twisted in horror over what he was implying. I keep forgetting you're human. That was very insensitive of me. We decided to walk in silence after that. I just wanted to find whatever Mr. Chatter was and get out of there. Even though we didn't see any bodies, it was becoming very clear people had died in this space. I hadn't heard or seen anything, and Rufus hadn't named a big bad monster to look out for. So what was killing these people, taking their bodies, and leaving their belongings behind? I walked around the copper-colored stains on the ground, but found it slowly get harder to walk around them. I really didn't want us to get to the point where the floor was entirely that dry blood color. I soon found out I didn't have any choice. Because I had my phone turned off, I didn't have any idea how much time had passed. It felt like we walked for at least an hour getting deeper into the endless twists and turns. To my surprise, we came across a door. I had very much hoped we arrived where we needed to deliver the envelope. It was not meant to be. We still had some walking ahead of us. Rufus stopped in front of the door and paused before opening it. He looked down at me, his expression deep in thought. Do you know any songs? It was such a weird question out of the blue. Still, I should just go along. He'd said he'd keep me safe in this strange place. Maybe. Why? I looked around, trying to see any changes. We were still alone, surrounded by traces of death. This room might be a bit... upsetting for people who not have adjusted to... certain smells... I find singing distracts me enough to get through it. 
Well, doing two things at once is hard for me. Not sure about your kind, though. Rufus really seemed like the type to not be good at multitasking. It was nice of him to take my newness to the job into consideration and warn me ahead of time. I didn't know if singing would help and I honestly was embarrassed to sing in front of anyone. I still should trust him and at least try, but damn my brain for not functioning in that moment. The only song I could think of was one from an old animated movie I watched to death in my childhood. I didn't remember the name of the movie, for some reason my brain decided to only remember the song. It was a short one. I felt my face flush from embarrassment. There was no way I was going to sing in this situation. I had thought Rufus was a dumb, yet nice guy. Still, with a method unknown to myself, he not only convinced me to sing, but we went through the short song twice. I was surprised he was smart enough to remember the lyrics after hearing it once. It made me feel a little bit prepared for whatever was behind that door. Rufus didn't pause in his singing when he opened the door and the smell hit us. My stomach fluttered as I started to feel queasy, but oddly enough, the singing helped. I took one step into the room and all the willpower drained from me completely. The room was small, it would only take me ten steps to get to the other side and the door. Those few steps were too much for me. The entire room had been soaked with blood. I could almost handle the rotting smell, but the added sense of the sight made my entire body freeze. Because the room was the same color, I hadn't noticed a shape vaguely resembling a person at first. It was a mass of gore, and if I squinted, I could make out human features like limbs and a head. I didn't want to squint. I didn't want to look. I squeezed my eyes shut and took one step forwards. Rufus was still singing on the other side, so if I followed his voice, I would be fine. The mass of gore was in the corner. I wouldn't trip on it if I just walked straight towards my co-worker. I tried to join to the song but only managed a weak few words. So far, I hadn't been in any actual danger. I hadn't seen any creatures aside from Rufus. He did his best to comfort me and tell me how even if something did attack me, I would be safe. Even knowing all that, I couldn't handle that room. Every step I took made my skin crawl and my stomach turn. The blood stuck to my shoes and when I stepped down, my foot slid a little on the soaking wet floor. My hands started to shake and I shoved them in my pocket trying to hide how scared I was. Hey, let's go. Hey, let's go. I muttered to myself the part of the song. Between my voice and Rufus's, I heard another small whisper coming from behind me. So small I didn't think I had heard anything at first. Help. That thing in the corner couldn't be alive. Nothing could be alive in that room. I was stressed out and hearing things. I raised my voice trying to drown it out, but it trembled. I'm happy as can be. Help. From how close Rufus sounded, I knew I was only a step or two from out of this nightmare room. I froze again when I felt something brush against my ankle. Slowly, fingers wrapped around just where my pant legs stopped. The grip was weak. Every nerve in my body was set on edge as I felt something wet soak through my sock from where the hand grabbed me. I heard that plea for help once more. With a burst of strength, I shot out of the room, kicking off whatever had taken a hold of me. I heard Rufus close the door. I collapsed against the wall, shaking violently, and tears threatened to fall. I curled up, head on my knees, trying to calm myself down. So what if my uniform was magic and could protect me from bullets? I wasn't being protected from any mental trauma from this place. Rufus was nice enough to not say anything to me as I collected myself. I bet he would have given me as much time as I needed, however, we were on a time limit I wasn't aware of. The red envelopes are time sensitive. If we don't deliver them fast enough, they explode. Your uniform would protect you, but it might destroy the room we're in and cause you to be lost somewhere between rooms, so, um, it's best if we get going. I swear we're really close, only two more rooms. Staring at my now bloody sneakers, it took everything I had to stand back up. Only two more rooms. I had to do this to get the hell out of there. To my surprise, I found our surroundings back to normal. Well, as normal as this place gets. The walls had gone back to the bare off-white without writings or stains. If it stayed like that, I could handle two more rooms. 
True to his word, we passed through two more hallways and into the last room. It looked all the same to me. I was glad to have him as my guide and in that moment, wondered why I was even with him. I mean, Rufus clearly could do this on his own. Maybe this was my shadow training day. Some places did make you just watch someone for the day. It was the only thing I could think of. Mr. Chatter should be behind that door. Just knock and he'll show up. Rufus told me when he had entered the last room. It was a dead end, and the first dead end I had seen in this place. On one wall had a drawn outline of a door, but no real way out. Even though we were so close to the end, anything Rufus was saying had been lost to me because I had seen her. A little girl, no older than ten, frantically struggling to free her leg that had faced through the door. She was dirty and looked like she had been stuck there for a long time. The poor thing looked scared to death. She was struggling so hard and bending her leg in a way that looked painful. It gave a little bit of give. I thought if she had a little bit more strength, she could pull herself free. Rufus saw me looking at her and he smiled. She's stuck between floors. She's actually on floor two, but with her leg stuck here, it looks like she's on this floor. Pretty neat, huh? This place works in such weird ways. Anyways, let's... I didn't let him finish. I just couldn't leave her. I ran forward and wrapped my arms around her to try to pull her free. The moment I took hold of her, my surroundings changed. I was no longer in the dull yet safe area, but inside a place so dark, I could only see it because of a lit road flare burning away a few feet from us. The poor girl was screaming trying to get me off her. I don't know why, but... The moment I took a hold of her, it transported me to a different floor. One much darker and dangerous. I'm trying to help, it's alright. I told her, frantically trying to calm her down. I really didn't blame her for freaking out because someone had suddenly grabbed her. With my help, I got some of her leg free. I wasn't fast enough though. I felt something hit my back hard. I didn't want to look behind me to see what was clawing at my back. Rufus was right, the uniforms did work. The thing was a mass of dark fur and teeth. It snagged the fabric, but it could not cut it to get to my tender flesh. I saw hundreds of eyes glittering in the darkness looking at us. A rumbling growl came and I nearly gave up on everything right then. I felt a sudden flash of pain on my cheek. The creature on my back had cut me in its struggle of trying to get to my back. In that moment, I realized a fault of the uniforms. It only protected what it was covering. My head was fair game if any more creatures came out. I had to get us both out of there, fast. The girl had stopped struggling and now it was only me trying to free her. I felt a strong grip on my arm and I screamed. Rufus suddenly appeared. He tore the creature from my back, tossing it into the darkness with one hand. Let go of her. If you keep touching her, you'll stay on this floor. You'll die in a few minutes. His voice was stern, but full of worry. I knew I was making a mistake, but I shook my head. I couldn't just leave a little girl behind. Dark shapes swooped in. I saw light shining off their teeth as they tried to attack us. Rufus was able to swat them away, but his hands were getting cut from the sharp claws. He easily could have pulled me from the girl. Instead of forcing me, he wanted me to make the right choice. He was such a kind person trying to talk me down from a mistake. You need to let her go. She's already dead. That couldn't be true. She had been moving a few seconds before. If I could pull her free, we could get her out of there. My eyes became unfocused and filled with tears. I could only see the girl's limp arms dangling and a sparkling bracelet reflecting off the road flare. A sound made me jerk my head up. A grunting roar cut through the darkness. Rufus reacted to it by kicking his leg into the dark while holding onto my arm. I couldn't see what his leg contacted onto. I only heard a horrible crunching ripping sound as I watched in horror as his leg kept moving, now missing everything below the knee. He had his pants rolled up so his uniform didn't protect him from whatever cut it off. I knew then I had to let the girl go or else we both were going to die. I let go of her and I grabbed a hold of him, and a second later I felt the sensation of falling. My entire body felt like I was being tossed around even though we were standing still. A sudden crashing force made me collapse to my knees, a feeling like I had just been in a car crash. I couldn't move for a few minutes. When I opened my eyes, I saw we were back in the dead end room. The girl was gone, her bracelet left behind on the floor behind me. Rufus was in bad shape. A pool of blood started around where his leg had been cut off. 
His eyes were closed and I feared he was dead. And it was all my fault. I should have just listened to him. My job was to deliver the mail, nothing else. If we finished the job and got out of here, I was certain I would be killed for my poor performance. I only took this damn job because my only other options were thinly veiled threats of death. Rufus opened his eyes, looking too weak to even sit up. I sat, waiting for him to yell at me, to blame me for everything. I'm sorry, I... I found myself unable to speak through the lump forming in my throat. It's alright, you are only human after all. He was smiling at me. I would have much rather him get angry. His kindness cut like a knife in that moment. He reached inside his jacket pocket to bring out the envelope we still had to deliver. All this trouble for such a small thing. All I had to do is take it and knock on the drawn on door. I felt too weak and so close to tears I nearly couldn't stand. His kind smile encouraged me enough to take it from him and walk over and knock on the wall. I took a few steps back after I did, terrified over what would happen. After I knocked, the fake door turned into a real one. It swung open in its own pitch black room beyond. I clutched the envelope in front of me staring into the darkness, waiting. As seconds slowly crept past, I started to hear a faint sound, a chattering, clicking noise that seemed like it was getting closer. I took another step back. Suddenly, the entire door was filled by a massive face slamming against it so hard it cracked the frame around it. I tripped over my own feet, screaming and falling hard on my ass. Somehow, I kept the envelope in my hand. My throat closed because I was so scared I couldn't make another noise. I couldn't move. I only sat with that thing in front of me. It was a human looking face, so large it took up the entire door. The chattering sound was coming from its mouth, opening and snapping shut at a frightening speed. For a moment I almost started to chatter my teeth together with it. It kept pressing, trying to fit its face through, trying to get to me. Teeth noisily coming towards me inch by inch. I don't know where I got the courage from. I stood up, legs shaking. Slowly, I took a few careful steps closer. The nose was rattling me down to my bones. I held out the envelope as far away from my body as I could muster. I closed my eyes, unable to handle seeing such a creature. Both of us inched closer to each other until finally its massive set of teeth closed over the corner of the envelope and stopped. The silence made me open my eyes. The creature known as Mr. Chatter had finally stopped snapping its mouth. Slowly, the red envelope started to burn away. When it was nothing but ash on the ground, the creature opened its mouth again, but this time to give out a bellowing, awful laugh. And for lack of a better way to put it, the entire head collapsed in on itself. The mass sucked into a pinpoint in space so quickly that in a blink of an eye it was gone. The door slammed shut, disappearing so it was just a plain wall again. I had finished the job, even if I had no idea what the hell just happened. A small click made me jump. With a relief, I saw another door had appeared, this one with a place to swipe my blank card I had received. I knew this was an opening to a zero room and the way out. The problem was dragging Rufus with me. I couldn't support his weight and he couldn't walk. I turned to look where I had left him, only to see something else in his place. A dog stood on three legs looking at me. He wore the same jacket Rufus had on and he had two light spots in his fur that looked very similar to what Rufus's eyebrows looked like. He was that Shiba Inu breed everyone online loved. Well, that solved that problem. I knew he could walk out on three legs, but I picked up the dog and pressed my face into its soft fur, tears threatening to overtake me. I'm sorry. I told him again, truly meaning it. I only got a bark as a reply. The zero room looked exactly like the other one. The receptionist did a double take at us. She got up and took Rufus from me, looking him over. I want to bet with my siblings. They all thought you would have died. Good job finishing the job. I was a little shocked that she wasn't angry at me either. I had nearly gotten her father killed after all. Was the other girl your twin? It was her turn to look a little surprised. She was dressed in the same clothing as the first girl we met, but there was a kinder air about her. I don't know how I knew it, but I was certain this girl was a different one from the other I met. Something like that. 
Anyway, you're done for the day. We'll send you a message when another job comes in. Now get out. She jabbed a thumb over her shoulder and towards the door. The sharp gesture felt like it also jabbed into my chest. I scurried out, Rufus giving a small bark as goodbye. I had never been so thankful being done a day of work. It felt like hours had passed and I was exhausted. I blinked in the morning light and tightened my jacket against the cool air. I had come out of a building different from the one I arrived at earlier. This one was a couple minute walk away from my place. I took my phone out to check what day it was, only to my confusion saw I had only been gone for two minutes. Everything that had happened only took two minutes real world time. I'm not proud to admit it, but when I got home, I cried harder than I ever had in my entire life. I don't think I'm the only one who has cried like that after their first day of work. I truly dread when I'll get another message for a new job. Even so, I made up my mind to take it. I owe it to my first partner. He gave up his leg for me to survive. To pay him back for it, I had to deliver mail. An odd situation to be in. I really only had myself to blame for it, though. A few weeks passed after my horrible first day of work being a mailman delivering mail to supernatural creatures. I was certain I would be fired after how horribly I did on my first day. I'd ignored my job description and gotten my partner injured. I expected to have serious ramifications for my actions, however, nothing happened. Since that day, I went through thousands of colored envelopes, placing the right colors in the right place. I wasn't sure what each color meant, aside from the red one needed to be sent out first, and I wasn't allowed to touch any black envelopes I saw. Instead, I would get my supervisor to take them. I only saw three of them while working in the sorting room so far. I worked with some strange looking creatures. One was a spider creature that barely had any human features and could sort almost as fast as lightning because of his arms. He only nodded towards me when I said hello to him every day. I was human in a workplace full of monsters. They weren't treating me as badly as I expected. I got a silent treatment. It was a bit unnerving when my supervisor looked at me as if I was a three course meal and he hadn't eaten for days. My supervisor was a human shaped wrapped in old bandages, similar to a mummy. His bandages were just sloppy wrapping trying to hide whatever was underneath instead of being wrapped for preservation purposes. White light shone through where his eyes should be. His mouth was exposed, showing a mouthful of needle teeth. He drooled a little whenever I spoke to him regarding work. He was nice enough to not address that reaction. Overall, it wasn't a bad job. I was starting to think I would be in the sorting room forever. One day, I got a message saying I needed to do a delivery job and to be at a location at 9 the next night. I dreaded going. I also wanted to see if I could get any information about my coworker Rufus, who lost a leg because of my incompetence. I hadn't been able to talk to any of my coworkers in the sorting room about it. The next night, I found myself in a room looking pretty much the same as the one I entered for my first job. It looked like an empty office with a pretty receptionist sitting at a fold-out table reading a magazine. She looked like the same girl who didn't greet me the last time. She didn't even look up at me when I walked over to her table. I pulled out a few packs of gum and placed it on the table for her. That got her attention. I got a smile out of her. And that was all. She stashed away her present, going back to her reading. Knock, knock. My heart leaped into my throat. Rufus was the type of person to announce his arrival at the same time as his knocking. I wanted to see him, but now that it was happening, I dreaded it. The past few weeks, I wanted to know if he was alright. I still wasn't emotionally ready to face someone who had gotten so hurt because of my mistake. Rufus was a tank of a man with dog ears and a cute curved tail. I hated it because it did not match his tough guy image. His kind personality didn't match his image either. He came out of the door from the other side of the room. Ignoring my clear distressed emotional state, he scooped me up into a big hug. I'm convinced if I wasn't wearing the magic mailman uniform that protected me from damage, I would have been crushed. His smiling face finally put me at ease after weeks of stress. His pant legs were rolled up. The leg he had lost had been replaced with another, looking very similar to his original dog-like leg. The replacement had black fur instead of the sandy brown. He had wrappings around his knee. By how he slowly walked compared to before, it seemed like Rufus wasn't fully healed up yet. I'm really glad you've been doing alright. I've been worried I would get fired because of what happened. I admitted to him. 
Fired? What? No, you're doing fine. Rufus said with a wide smile that made me feel only slightly better. Your leg got torn off on my first day. I said, still not being able to get over that fact. Well, yes, that isn't great. He admitted, sounding almost guilty for a moment. Don't worry about this. This sort of thing happens, and unlike you humans, legs can easily be replaced. I just wanted to drop by and introduce you to your partner for this job. If you get along, you'll be partners for a while. I didn't know what I expected partner-wise. It could literally be anything, and I mean it. I saw a pile of mushrooms walking around the sorting room once. I was pleasantly surprised by a man looking to be around my age. He was very similar to Rufus. His personality was as friendly as my previous partner. Hi-ho! My new partner came in the room the same door Rufus arrived from. He walked across to me, taking my hand to shake it in the same greeting my old partner had. I'm... He spouted off a garble of syllables not meant for a human to pronounce as his name. Him and Rufus must be related. Max. The receptionist finally spoke. All right, my human name is Max. He was at least a foot taller than me, but smaller than Rufus. His dog ears on the top of his head were fairly large compared to his head. I saw paws poking out from his rolled down pants leg. His hand had soft sandy fur covering them, claws for fingernails. When he shook my hand, I felt small pads on his fingertips, making his hands a paw-hand hybrid. And yes, he did have a curved tail. It suited him far better than Rufus, so I didn't hate it. Max is my son. I suggested him for your new partner. I think you would get along. Rufus explained. Max looked like he could barely contain his excitement. Him and his father were much different from all the other creatures that only saw me as a meal. I think this would work out just fine. Your job is to deliver this to Horn Slithers. The receptionist told us, placing a small cardboard box on the table to take. Max scooped the box up, ready to get started. This is going to be an easy job. I hear Horn Slither hangs out in parks on the human side of things. Not dangerous at all, Max explained to me. That made me wonder something that had been rattling inside my brain for a while. As far as I could tell, mail was delivered in teams of two. More if the job was extra dangerous. If it was a simple job, why waste resources and send an extra person? With the last job, if Rufus went alone, I was certain he would have done just fine. This sounded like an easy job today, so why even have me go along? How come we have teams of two for everything? I asked. Oh, simple really. Even if we think it's an easy job, we really can't predict anything that goes on in the field. Teams of two were far more likely to get the job done and have one worker return. You know that joke about you don't need to be faster than the thing chasing you, only faster than the person running with you? <laughs> yeah. Max explained as he trailed off, looking beyond me, clearly remembering something unpleasant in his past. Anyway, let's get going. Max recovered quickly, going back to his pleasant self. We both said our goodbyes to Rufus and left the meeting room. The room we had met inside were called Zero Rooms. They could be controlled when to appear and where the entrances and exits went. We went through the door I arrived in, but it no longer was connected to the building I had entered through. We walked out into a damp and dark public bathroom. The stall was the door we came out of. When the door closed, it returned to being a normal stall door. I used my phone to get a look around. It wasn't clean, but not as dirty as other public park bathrooms I've seen. The door to the outside was locked, and I feared we would be trapped inside until the morning and a park worker came by to let us out. Max made sure that didn't happen. With a one swift kick, the door not only burst out from the hinges, but slammed against a tree, metal completely twisted. I'm glad Max was friendly, I never wanted to upset him if a low effort kick could do that much damage. I'll sniff around trying to find a good spot to wait. I don't know what horn slithers smell like, but... Supernatural creatures are different from humans. I can tell the difference. Max explained when we got out of the bathroom. He placed the box we should be delivering on his head between his ears and started to walk with large, playful steps. I was utterly mortified that he was started to sing the song I taught Rufus on the last job. He was singing it out loud, even if the lyrics were incorrect. 
He paused, trying to think of the next verse, and I jumped in with a question trying to distract him from singing in a dark and empty park. How come Slithers has the title of Honored? Is he super important or something? Max looked a little confused over my question, as if I should know the answer already. Honored is just what we use instead of Mr. or Miss, because some creatures don't have a gender, or they have a gender that hasn't been named. It's a sign of respect. We wouldn't have a job if these creatures weren't sending mail or receiving it. Mind you, some just use whatever title they like. I've come across females that go by Mr. because they like the sound of it. Same goes for males and the ones without genders. Didn't you read all of this in the handbook? The last part made me stop dead in my tracks. What handbook? No one has ever told me about a handbook. I only received a blank swiped card to get inside the zero rooms and a pair of uniforms. You would think something this important would have been brought up before now. I never got one. I admitted. What? You did a job without a handbook and lived? Humans are so impressive. Max looked so excited I didn't have the heart to tell him I didn't actually do anything on my first job but mess it up. I really needed to look into getting a handbook once we got back. I'll send a message seeing if we could get you one. I would lend you mine, but it's not for your language, so you can't read it. I don't think any one of us have one in a human language, so maybe that's why you don't have one yet. The last time we accepted humans was around 500 years ago. The handbook gets outdated fast, so I can't give you one of those. Even if he did, I doubted I could read English from 500 years ago. And he said a human language it could be written in anything. I would just go without. Max was friendly enough and he answered any questions I had so far. It wasn't a big deal until we got a more dangerous job. We walked through the park, Max leading the way. I saw a few people walking home from work but none looked our way. I wondered if they could even see us or if the uniforms had some sort of magic that made us invisible to humans. After all, I really couldn't explain away Max having a very real set of dog ears and a tail. Max stopped at a bench under a streetlight, sniffing the air a few times he sat down. I sat next to him, looking around, expecting to see anything besides, well, an empty park at night. Do you know when Honored Slithers is going to show up? I asked after a few minutes of listening to Max hum next to me. Nope. I looked over at him, confused. Are we just going to sit there all night waiting? Wait, so are we really just going to sit here and wait? Isn't there a way to contact them saying the package is ready? I asked and Max looked like he wasn't sure he wanted to answer my question. Well, no, we don't really have a way to call others anymore. Some creatures that have embraced human culture own those things called, uh, phones? We can call them that way. It's sort of a long answer why creatures like us can't call each other with our own way. We might be here all night. I'm alright listening. I said, and Max brightened up in my answer. There's what you humans would call a spell to call each other. It had to be broken and no longer used because we accepted humans to deliver messages a while ago. It started out fine working with them, but soon they started to hate us for our nature. Some of us do kill and eat humans. The humans had to watch and do nothing when they saw it while working. No one is really angry at your mistake on the first day. We honestly expected it of you. Anyway, the spell was a written one. You would write the creature's name, then what action you want the spell to take. They figured out how to break down the spell and create a different one. It was used to summon and bind any creature they knew the name of. Those humans only used it for a few days, but they had enough time to slaughter thousands of us. I can understand why it happened, but not all of the ones who are born to the night harm your race. They don't even interact with anyone. They're completely harmless. However, they were killed as well. My father and I have names starting with a letter near the end of our alphabet in our language, so that's why we lived through it. Woo, what a scary time. It was a strange feeling hearing Max tell me about humans try mass killing his species. I really didn't know what this feeling was. The image of that little girl from my first job came to mind. She had suffered and died. For what? How many humans had suffered because of these supernatural creatures? How many had been killed for no reason aside from something wanting to have some fun? Just how many people suffered never knowing what happened to a person they dearly loved? Max was friendly, so was Rufus. They could have died because of what they were. They didn't deserve it, but it felt like some creatures that had been slaughtered back then should have been killed. 
It was such a grey area, I couldn't decide on a good answer to my feelings. I didn't want to admit to Max I thought some would be better off dead when to him they were doing nothing wrong. Those creatures were just eating, it didn't matter who got hurt. I felt my phone buzz in my pocket. It was just a message from my father asking if he could borrow money next week. Max looked over at my phone, very interested. Any kind of conversation about work got derailed after that. Max didn't know much about humans. He rarely interacted with them, so what he did know was just bits and pieces he could get secondhand. I would be getting a huge bill for using so much data that night. It was well worth it. For the rest of the night, I showed him everything I could think of on my phone. He loved videos of dogs and puppies, but lost his mind over cats. I don't think there was another person who loved cats as much as Max did the moment he saw one. The night passed without seeing any of the supernatural creatures. When the sky started to lighten, we went back to the bathroom and entered the stall where the zero room door appeared. Dropping the package back off at the receptionist, we were off for the day. The next two nights went about the same. We got paid for sitting on the bench looking at cute cat videos. I bought snacks for us, seeing if Max would like human food. He loved it. It only took three nights of me hanging out with him to forget the distressing truth I learned when I took this job. I was working with creatures of the night, and those creatures were killing humans. A little bit past 11 that night, the truth came crashing down around me. We were eating snacks, looking at more videos when I heard screams and cries for help coming from down the walkway fairly close to us. I bolted to my feet, then froze remembering my last outing. I could not save this woman crying out for help. It went against my job. I could only deliver mail and not interfere in my supernatural affairs. I gritted my teeth, listening to the cries for a few seconds when Max spoke up. Shouldn't you be doing something? He asked, a mouthful of jerky. I can't save a human from a creature. It goes against my job. I admitted as my chest started to hurt. Yes, that's right, but what's going on is a human-on-human -human thing. I can smell it. You can deal with it if it's two humans fighting. Max explained. He didn't need to tell me twice. I was so panicked and worried I did everything wrong. Max had my phone. I didn't even think of grabbing it from him before running off. In a few seconds of running toward the sound of the attack, I saw a woman being assaulted by a man. He was pulling at her clothes, trying to tear at it. She swatted at him, screaming for help. Judging by how she was moving, it looked like she had either sprained or twisted her ankle. I didn't stop to think, I just grabbed him, yanking him off of her, hoping she would take that chance to run. The problem was, I didn't have any sort of plan beyond that. I also had never been in a fight before. In a fury, the man turned on me. To my horror, he pulled a knife from his pocket and swung it at me. I raised my arm to block it, expecting some pain. The knife snapped when it hit my sleeve. It was nice to know that the uniform not only protected me from supernatural threats, but also human weapons. Tossing the knife aside, he wasted no time. I was forced to the ground. Any punches to my chest also were blocked from the uniform. I tried getting some swings in, but I wasn't very strong. My attacks missed. It was simply useless in a fight. Unable to stop him, the man grabbed a fist-sized rock and slammed it against my head a few times. The weak point of my magic uniform is it didn't protect what wasn't covered. Pain flooded my head as everything went dark. I don't know how long I was out for, maybe only a few minutes. I came to, head pounding and struggling to sit up. My attacker had turned his attention to the girl again, who failed to run away. He wrapped his arm around her waist, trying to drag her deeper into the trees along the trail. When I saw that, my mind went into a blank fury. I never thought I was a violent person, or even an angry one. I always thought I was a bit of a wimp. Something just snapped. I refused to let another person get hurt because I couldn't do a damn thing about it. My head was pounding, but my body didn't react to the pain. I just got up and threw myself at the man, prying him off the poor girl once more. I don't know where the strength came from. I got him on the ground, sat on his chest, and just let loose. I faintly remember hearing crying behind me as I punched his face with everything my body held. My knuckles got torn and ruined from slamming into his teeth. My head ached, and blood from a cut on my forehead poured over one eye, stinging it, forcing it closed. My arms felt like they were on fire, but I didn't let myself stop. When I felt like I couldn't hit him anymore, I pressed my forearm over his neck and pressed down. I was positive I would have killed him if I didn't feel a soft touch on my shoulder, snapping me from my crazed state. 
I felt something take me from under my arms and lift me off into the side. What had stopped me from my attempted murder was a creature I assumed was Slithers. It was made of inky black wiggling tubes that shone like oil. Two orbs of flaming white light hovered where its face should be. Seeing the monster snapped me back to a reasonable state of mind. I sat on the ground, panting, completely worn to the bone. Without warning, my stomach hitched and I puked up all the snacks I'd eaten that night. Thankfully, off to the side and not on my uniform. I heard Max arrive. He sat next to the shocked girl I had tried to save. He tried to calm her down, she just kept crying. I didn't blame her. The entire thing was a shock to any normal person. She didn't need another seeing of a squirming creature. Max left her to walk up to the monster that had stopped my assault and handed it the box. He then took out a sheet of paper to get the monster to sign it. It just pressed the bottom, leaving a black spot as a signature. Then, to my horror, Slithers took the beaten and bloodied man into his squirming tubes of black. I heard sickening crunching sounds and I knew the man was dead. I thought I had used up everything I had. When Slithers turned and started to move towards the girl, my body found the strength to stand up, putting myself between them. There were a few tense seconds of a showdown between us before Max broke it up. It's fine. He won't hurt her. Honored Slithers is a scavenger. They only eat the dead or the near dead. I think they hung out here because that man you attacked was killing humans in this park and Honored Slithers just cleaned up the mess. Max explained. I felt my stomach turn again and I had to turn away to dry heave. I felt sick down to my bones. If I didn't attack that man so badly, he would be alive. I was the reason why a man was dead. If I just had him arrested, we might learn how many girls he had killed. And Slithers ate them. And now, the murder. There would be no evidence of the crimes. Families would never get to know what happened to those poor girls all because I couldn't control myself. I was just as bad, if not worse than the monsters I had been judging. Through tears and dry heaving, I watched as Slithers open the box Max delivered to him. Inside was an old My Little Pony toy one from the original show. It looked to be in good shape, the fake gems glittering dully in the dim light. None of us were expecting the toy, and none of us were expecting Slithers to go over to the poor, traumatized girl, handing it to her. We did not have time to question the action. I heard voices and saw a flashlight beam. Cops! Book it! Max yelled, and all three of us moved at once. He took off running, then had to double back to grab me because I was not as fast as he was. Slithers frantically looked around and made a mad dash off into the trees. We left that poor girl with the strangest story and the cute toy. I expected once again to be written up for my actions. I only got an eyebrow from our receptionist, then got sent on my way. Because it was a human-on-human -human interaction, she didn't care nor offer me any medical treatment. I received notice for another delivery job two days from then in the morning. I got myself cleaned up the best I could. I feared going into the doctor to get my head checked down. I didn't want them to press me to report what had happened to the police because it was clear it had been a fight. I could just hope I didn't have a concussion. Our next delivery job sounded simple. It was a large sword wrapped in Christmas paper. It was so large I couldn't lift it. Max easily took it, carrying it as if it weighed nothing. We sat in front of a convenience store, waiting for a creature to pick up the package. Max could tell I was feeling down, but wasn't well versed in humans enough to figure out how to cheer me up. It was the time of year when the night was chilly, but the days got hot. Sitting out front, the sun started to rise, so did the temperature. I thought I would feel hotter wearing a jacket as part of my uniform, but I wasn't too uncomfortable in the sun. I still bought us both a popsicle from the store, a chocolate one for myself and an orange one for Max. I sat, turning the last job over in my head. I hated the idea of victims never being found because of my actions, but that would only be the case if Slithers actually ate them. I learned that the ones receiving packages could request a certain set of workers for the job. It helped keep certain races away from others if the mail company wasn't aware of bias. I felt as if Slithers saw what was happening in that park and couldn't stop it. They ordered something when they heard a human was working for the mail delivery. They may have hoped I saw the man attacking a girl and put a stop to it. That was just hopeful thinking on my part. Aside from Slithers giving the girl the pony toy, I had no proof there was any kind of kindness in the pile of squirming shapes. Slithers was a supernatural creature, 
and it was in its nature to eat humans. Putting an end to a serial killer in the park would remove the food source. It was not in their best interest to have it stop. Max, if I wasn't there, would you have saved her? I asked him, finally breaking out of my thoughts. No, he asked honestly. I didn't blame him. She was not of his species, not his job, not his world, not his problem. I had finished my popsicle and saw writing on the stick. It said I won a free one and I couldn't think they still ran that sort of promotion. Without a second thought, I started to turn and offer it to Max. I didn't really have any proof to support my theory that there was some good monsters out there. Yes, some did kill people without a second thought. Monsters lurked in the darkness of the night waiting. But there might be some kind creatures too. At the same time, Max turned towards me, popsicle stick in hand. He had also won a free treat. At the same time, we both had offered it to each other, causing us to laugh when we realized <laughs> what we had done. Because of a very embarrassing event I do not even wish to think about, let alone write down, I became a mailman that worked with cryptids. My first job was a rocky one, and I ended up being the reason why my partner lost his leg. He not only forgave me for what happened, but he trusted his son, Max, to be my next delivery partner. It was a pretty good fit. Max had an endless amount of energy and answered my questions the best he could. I still did not have a handbook to explain the rules of my new job and the culture of the world I had been thrown into. Even after a few delivery jobs, I didn't have a good grasp on the creatures around me. Max did answer my questions, but he easily got distracted because he was equally in the dark about human culture. While we did our job, I often ended up talking about how the human world operated and totally forgot to ask him questions. I carried a notebook tucked inside my uniform jacket pocket, but only filled a few pages of what I had learned so far. We finished a few delivery jobs together. Aside from the disaster the first and second job had been, we were doing pretty well. I assumed we got easy jobs because I was human. Being human made me lack certain skills needed for this job. Still, I tried my best, even if most jobs really was just sitting around places we knew our client frequented to hand over a package or a letter. I was ready to do another shift in the sorting room, but saw I received a text about a delivery job in the door location. Every time it was a different building, but the doors all led to the same room. I would find the panel beside the locked entrance to swipe my blank card to get inside a zero room. Those rooms, as far as I knew, existed outside of time and space. They looked like an empty office and could be controlled when and where to appear. They were used to meet the cold, yet pretty, receptionist to give us our job task for the shift. For once, I arrived after Max. He was holding two bags of chocolates, a wide smile on his face. I've rarely seen him this excited. He was always in high spirits, but today, he was bouncing on his heels, his clawed feet scraping the carpet. We have an easy job today. He explained and couldn't stop from wagging his tail a little. Yes, Max did have a tail. He also had large, fluffy ears that blended into his sandy brown hair at the top of his head. His eyes nearly glowed because of how bright of a yellow tone he had been gifted with. Each time he smiled, large teeth made me a little bit nervous. Clawed, furred hands had accidentally cut mine a few times when he handed me things in the past. I was never mad about him. It's not his fault his nails were so sharp and grew back every time he tried to trim them for my sake. When I first shook his hand, I felt small pads on his fingertips, much like dog paws. I've wanted to touch them again ever since, but wasn't sure if that was an offensive request. Haven't we always had easy jobs? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Any time we had problems on a job was because I let my emotions get the better of me. I knew if Max, or Rufus, my first partner, worked without me, they would have had no issues. It wasn't as if we had been sent into overly dangerous areas, and the creatures we delivered items for wouldn't attack us because of the no shooting the messenger rule. Although it was very unnerving being treated like food by all of our clients and all of my co-workers, I know if Max didn't work with me, he would have no issues eating me. I still liked him as a person, but that fact still made me a little nervous. This one is going to be super easy, like a few minutes tops, and there's a surprise after too. Let's get going. I barely had time to drop off the packs of gum to the receptionist sitting at the table. It had become a habit of mine. 
Sure, she never really talked to me or gave me that many friendly looks, but I thought her job must be boring and getting some gifts might brighten up her day. Max had taken my arm to drag me to the door on the other side of the room, pushing me through. Where we ended up was in the middle of a hiking trail. Normally, the doors to the delivery location came from already existing doors in the area. If there wasn't any, a door would just appear until we closed it. The trail was dark, and I wisely brought a flashlight. In the past, I had drained my phone batteries on delivery jobs. Max was naturally faster than me. He would walk a few paces in front of me, stop, and wait, then keep going. It felt like a video game escort missing, but I was the slow NPC everyone hated. I really didn't know why they needed me on these jobs. Maybe it was just for the learning experience. I wasn't helping most of the time, and sometimes just made things worse. Max stopped on the trail and crouched down. I joined him, seeing nothing special, just dirt and grass. I waited as he sniffed the air, double-checking we found the right spot. Then, I noticed movement in the grass. Max did too, and opened the bag of chocolate. It was one with small, pre-wrapped assorted pieces. At first, I thought some sort of rodent was moving around in the grass. When I saw what it really was, I knew why Max had been excited for this job. These tiny creatures were absolutely adorable, if you don't mind spiders, that is. I don't really know the right terms for supernatural creatures. I've heard the name Arachne being thrown around for half human, half spider monsters, but I may be wrong, because apparently the name also goes with the Greek myth I was too lazy to read about. Anyway, these things were small, only four inches tall. The top half of them was human enough, but covered in a soft looking fur, and each had different pastel coloring. Even their spider bottom half had fur. They did not look threatening at all, even with two large fangs sticking out from their mouths and eight black eyes looking up at us. Very politely, they took a chocolate from Max and scurried off back into the grass. Some even did a little excited dance, tapping all their little feet before leaving. What are these things and why are they so cute? This should be illegal. I said not being able to get over the fact there was such a small and precious monster species. They don't have an English name because you humans can't see them. You're only able because it's your job. Once a month they all gather to get some treats. The postal company covers it because they can get kind of... Well, they like to pull pranks on humans. Max explained to me. He handed me a few chocolates so I could give them out to these tiny creatures. In the flashlight beam, their cute pastel pinks and blues were easy to make out. The small, furry hand tickled a little when they reached over to grab a chocolate. After seeing dark and nearly heart-stopping terrifying monsters, the little guys were a very welcome change. A few minutes passed and I felt something brush against my neck. I thought it was some hair or the tag on my jacket. Max looked over at me and then reached over at the back of my jacket collar. He plucked one of the furry spiders off from where I had felt it a second ago. Putting it on the ground with its friends, he gave it a treat and sent it on its way. For some reason, he reached over to me to zip my jacket up all the way up to the chin. I looked at him rather confused. It's best if you don't let them go on your neck. They... uh... Max paused in the same way he always paused when he had some sort of bad news to give. They like to burrow into human skulls. It kills them, but somehow they connect to the brain, keeping it alive and the human aware of their body rotting away, unable to do anything. We honestly don't know if they do it for food or if it's just for fun. I dropped all the chocolates in my hands to bring them up to my collar and tighten it closer against my skin. Why couldn't I have just one nice thing with this damn job? Max, please read the mood here. I didn't need to know that. I just wanted to think that there was just one nice creature out there. But now, this cursed fact is in my head, making me unable to find these little spiders as cute as before. After a few minutes, we saw less and less of them. We still had a whole other bag of chocolates left to give out. I didn't know if we had to sit there all night waiting for more to show up. Max did say we only had a few minutes at this job. When he didn't see any more spiders, he backed up a little to give himself some space on the trail. Using a clawed finger, he drew a perfect circle in the dirt. And I mean perfect. I was impressed, but according to my snooping, Max was a few hundred years old, so he had time to practice. Placing the open second bag in the middle, he started to write strange symbols around the circle. 
I knew supernatural creatures use spells. I never saw them use one, so I thought the spells was just chanting or with wands or something. Max noticed my confusion and stopped to explain what he was doing. I don't think I've shown you a written circle spell yet. Most of our spells are circle-based ones. Even humans can use them for summoning and the like. But it's really rare it happens because you don't know how to write our language. You also don't have the same kind of power in your blood for the spell to get energy from you, so you need to use sacrifices. And you need to draw a perfect circle yourself without the use of tools. Spells are easy for creatures like us because we have always used them, and practice drawing a circle the moment our hands can move. I'll break down what this one is for. Max had told me that hundreds of years ago, humans got a hold of the knowledge to summon and mass slaughter monsters. Because of that, cryptids removed certain spells and didn't accept humans working until I was hired. I was flattered that he felt safe enough telling me about how this spell worked until I realized he only was because he was certain I couldn't draw a circle, let alone the complex writing surrounding it. So the first layer of writing should always have the name of what you're directing the spell towards, followed by the action. Because this one is very simple, we'll only have two layers. Max explained, pointing to the first line of text surrounding the circle. In seconds, he scratched in the dirt more of the odd writing, however, it didn't finish it. Spells with complex actions against powerful creatures needs a lot of circles, text, and sacrifices. This spell is directed toward the little spiders we saw before. They can enter the circle only if they have not eaten chocolate in the past month, and can only leave with one piece to keep them from getting greedy. The second layer is to make the chocolate invisible to everything but the spiders, and protect it from the elements. This also breaks in a month, so we just need to come by and pick up the empty bag. I wasn't expecting this to be so well thought out. I made notes inside my little book I carried with me. As I was writing, Max found the old bag from the previous trip and picked it up from a nearly faded circle. This system made it so any latecomers would still get their chocolate and one of us didn't have to stay and wait. Only around 20 minutes passed since arriving. I wasn't expecting us to be done so soon. A rumbling off in the distance made me glad we weren't going to stay outside all night. I guess we're done here. Let's find the door and head back. I said, standing up with a stretch. I double checked to make sure no little spiders were hanging around on my jacket and near my neck. Wait, no, not yet. This is the best part. We're close by to a really neat place. I never get this job and I can't wait to go by and see it. Max looked like an excited teenage girl. I shone my flashlight on him to see his tail wagging away. It was hard to believe he had killed humans before because it was just his culture to do so. He looked far too nice to do any harm. As long as we leave before the rain starts, then lead the way. I didn't have the heart to make him go back after seeing how excited he was. Max left me behind again, humming a song I really wished he would forget about. I wasn't sure what to expect. After all, Max wasn't human, so his tales weren't predictable. I did not expect for him to stop in front of an old, wooden, and clearly closed bridge. He waited for me to walk up and posted in front as if I was witnessing the eighth wonder of the world. It's a closed bridge. I stated the obvious. It's the Red Devil Pass. Max corrected, sounding offended. For over a hundred years, people have claimed to see creatures or the devil himself on it. Rumor has it, on a full moon, if you go over the bridge at midnight, you have a chance of your soul being snatched away. It's not at all true, of course. Then why are you excited? Max paused and looked at me. He did not understand why I saw this as just some local legend hotspot and nothing special. I do admit that having a person with dog features claiming a local supernatural rumor to be fake was a bit weird. I really should start asking him if certain cryptids were real or not. Oh, right, you're human. It's easy to forget that. It's, well, huh, how do I put this? A spot with such a history holds a certain power, I guess. Creatures like myself can get a thrill just being in the area. Some even absorb all the remaining feelings the rumors leave behind. The longer the history, the better. That made sense. In my mind, I thought of it as someone from the city going to a place with clean air. I understood why Max was so happy for this job. He got to see cute spiders and now he was able to see a supernatural tourist area. More rumbling came from a threatening storm. Alright, but I do think it's going to rain, so... 
I'll just go across the bridge and back. It'll only take a few minutes. I'll finally be able to take this area off my list of places to visit. I was fine waiting for him. He easily climbed over the waist-height boards, warning people that the bridge was out of service and dangerous. Honestly, the signs looked useless. If anyone really wanted to go on it, they could. But it would be their funeral if the wood gave out under them. I wasn't worried for Max, though. I've seen him kick down a solid metal door with no effort. Even if he fell through to the water below, he would only end up smelling like a wet dog. It took a lot to injure him. I was not prepared when in the middle of the bridge, he suddenly stopped his giddy little walk and simply collapsed. I stood, holding my flashlight, not being able to accept what I just saw. Max never runs out of energy. He never slows down. So why did he just fall over? I didn't even see any other person or creature around us. Without thinking, I ran to him. I leapt over the boards and onto the creaking wooden bridge. A sudden force on my back slammed me down onto the wood, making it creak so loudly I thought it would break. It was a struggle raising my head. It felt like gravity just suddenly increased around me, pinning me down. My uniform, as I understood it, was a little bit magical. It protected me from sharp claws and even bullets, but it couldn't fully protect me from the crushing force pressing down on me. I couldn't move, but I had to see if Max was alright. I refused to give in to whatever was trying to keep me down. I raised my head as much as I could to see a figure step onto the bridge near Mac. A large, dark hand reached down to grab him by the back of his jacket and started to draw him along towards me. He remained limp, and my chest hurt seeing him getting dragged like a rag doll. It took everything in me to raise my head enough to see what had taken hold of my friend. Sweat poured down my face, and in the dim moonlight, I saw the creature. It was massive. The entire body was black with cracked skin. Different torn fabric hung down from its neck, covering most of its body in layers. The thing had no head, just an empty neck with flames spouting out. As it got closer, the flames flickered, and I thought I saw a shape of a smiling mouth in the dancing flames. Each thudding step made my heart want to stop. Looking at Max again, I struggled even more trying to sit up. I wanted to do something. I could not forgive myself if he got hurt. Not after everything that had happened from my last jobs and not after I failed to protect a single person. By some miracle, I was able to get up on my elbows before a massive foot came down on my back, shoving me down. My lungs felt like they were going to be crushed. If I didn't have my uniform on, I would have died. A human? What a strange sight. Here I am collecting creatures who are attracted to this place and a human is with one? The creature's voice was sweet sounding. It was so off-putting. I would have preferred a raspy threatening one. Even with the foot forcing me down, I summoned enough strength to get my head off the bridge to reach towards Max. He looked asleep and unharmed, but that was a good sign for now. Enough of that. The creature lifted a foot and kicked me against the sign so hard they tore free. Again, I was thankful for the uniform protecting me. I still had the wind knocked out of me and couldn't sit up for at least a minute. I sat gasping trying to get up to see if the creature and Max were still there. I was no match for this thing. I had no special skills or knew any spells to stop it. The one thing I learned from my job was supernatural creatures love deals. My only hope was I had something this thing wanted more than Max. Let him go. My voice was pathetic, but those flames looked surprised when I spoke up. He's not human, and if you weren't working together, he would have no problem killing you, and you want him back? The monster asked, holding Max up by his jacket so his paws dangled off the ground. He's my friend. What can I trade for him? I tried to sound as strong as I could, but I wasn't even able to sit up fully yet. I doubted this creature would want to make a deal with me. It could just kill me and be done with it. I was a mailman, and on the job, I didn't have to worry about supernatural clients eating me. But the flaw in that was if I wasn't delivering something to the creature, they could kill me and only get a slap on the wrist. Sure, the postal company didn't like having to hire new workers, but if we walked into another's territory, it was our problem. And this was a big problem. This bastard had been waiting on the bridge for people like Max to show up. I knew creatures ate each other to gain power, but Max joked none would go for him because he was so weak. Seeing how strong he was compared to a human made me scared of how strong other monsters out there were. According to all the rules, I knew this ambush was valid. 
You're a human. There is nothing. The flame stopped flickering as if deep in thought. My entire body felt chilled as I waited for it to speak again. There is something. This little one isn't that much of a meal. A certain type of human flesh would do better for me. If you bring me, let's say, five pounds of virgin human flesh, I would give him back safe and sound. You have until sunrise to do so, and it must be given up willingly, so no threatening someone to hand it over. Now, get going. I couldn't believe this thing was going to make a deal with me. I had recovered enough to stand. Giving one last look at Max and mentally promising I would save him, I ran down the trail. My first thought was to find the door we came out of and go to the receptionist telling her about the situation. I hadn't paid any attention to where we came from and feared I would waste the entire night looking and getting lost for the door. I checked my phone, trying to find my location. I had no idea where I was. The door dropped us out in different parts of the country most times. I didn't know how long the trail was and if I would find any help or a city by sunrise. My phone had no signal. Even on data, it refused to load. It might be because I was in the middle of nowhere, but also because there was a creature in the area. Max told me that supernatural creatures messed up cell phones if they were around them. Because he was on the weaker end, my phone had no issues with him, but whatever was on the bridge behind me was much stronger. I could only stick to the trail, hoping to get into some sort of signal range. My bad luck kept happening. I heard more rumbling of thunder and the sky opened up. In seconds, it was pouring down so hard I could barely see in front of me. I dropped my flashlight back on the bridge, but I knew I would lose at least one and kept a smaller backup in my pocket. It didn't help as I kept running down the trail, mud and water splashing against my pants, my socks and shoes soaked in seconds. The slick mud made me trip, gracefully sliding along getting a face full of water. I sat up panting, about to start running again, but my brain finally caught up to my body. I had to calm down and think about this. If I found the door leading back to the zero room, I don't think I would get help to save Max. I doubted the postal company had pounds of human flesh just around ready for a trade. In this rain, and with my small light, I doubted I would find the door we came through to start with. If I got to a town, then what? I would never be able to convince someone to come with me and just let me cut parts off of them. Even if I did, there was no way to really prove they were a virgin or not. Getting someone else up to the bridge was never an option. Deep down, I knew from the start what I had to do. I had to find something sharp. If I could just find an axe or hell, I would settle for a large kitchen knife at that point. The moment I recovered enough, I needed to keep running down the trail until I found a house or a barn. With a plan in my head and the rain thankfully letting up to a drizzle, I started running again. Rufus gave up a leg for me. I was going to return the favor and save his son. In that moment, I thought I was all on my own and no hope of any help showing up. I literally ran into a possible solution. In the small beam of my light, a dark shape rose from the ground. I didn't stop in time, running full speed into it. I tasted a briny liquid slam into my mouth. I backed away, spitting, trying to get rid of the taste. Slithers? I was so shocked I forgot to address the creature as honored. It didn't seem to mind. Slithers was a creature made of squirming black snake-shaped tubes. It had no face aside from a pair of white burning lights hovering over the wiggling mass that looked like eyes. We met on my second job. I didn't know much about them aside from it might be soft for human girls. I had no proof on that assumption. I had no ideas why Slithers suddenly appeared. Uh, Max is in trouble. Can you send out a message? We need to get someone here to help him. I spilled out in a frantic voice. To my disappointment, Slithers formed two arms, raising them in front of its body, and its eyes shook in a clear no. A burst of rage came to my chest, but I calmed down when I remembered how these creatures worked. Most of them did not get involved in others' affairs. It wasn't Slithers' place to help out. Still, why were they here? I hadn't even heard anything about them since that brief delivery job. I need a knife or a blade or something. Can you go and find something like that for me? I prayed this would work. If Slithers couldn't send a message asking for help, maybe they could provide me what I needed. I didn't know if they would do it for free, though. I may need to make a deal with him for this request. It looked like Slithers was thinking it over. Their eyes darted back and forth, and I felt my anxiety rising. I could almost see the exclamation point over Slithers' head as a wiggling hand went to their chest. 
To my horror, Slithers formed two hands to reach in and pull their chest apart. Keeping the hole open, it dug around and started to pull random items out covered in what looked to be ink. Army helmets, dog tags, rusted guns poured out into a pile as they rooted around looking for something. Slithers was a scavenger. They could only eat the dead or near dead. It made total sense Slither hung around war-torn areas. Depending on how old they were, what was pouring out may be from the Second or First World War. More modern items such as wallets, keys, and glasses came out from the endless pit of the creature's body. Finally, Slithers found what they were looking for, a rusty machete. It looked too dull to be able to cut anything. The thought counted though. I don't think that's going to work. I told them, trying to sound as nice as possible. I got a wave of their hand. I watched as Slithers took one of their flaming eyes into their palm and placed it over the top of the blade's handle. In seconds, the entire blade turned black and was no longer a rusty tone. I had no idea what had happened, but if the blade was as sharp as it looked, it would work. But for what I needed it for, I had to make sure it could cut sure and quick. Reading my mind, Slithers guided me over to a decent sized rock on the side of the trail. Placing the handle in my hand, they held both my wrists so I was holding the blade over the rock. With their guidance, the blade came down with no resistance. Zero resistance. It cut even smoother than a hot knife through butter. I looked at the blade, amazed that it could cut a rock so cleanly in half. Slithers pulled away, and I looked at them, my mouth open and a loss for words. Uh, thank you. What do I owe you for this? Slithers raised a hand and waved it. I wasn't sure if that motion meant, oh, don't worry about it, or you can pay me back later. I owe you one. I gave Slithers a wave and started to run back towards the bridge. I really didn't know why they would just help me out like that. I was a food source and yet Slithers just appeared to solve my problem. Maybe Slithers was doing this for Max. Saving another creature of the night made more sense than helping a human out. Regardless of the reason, I was beyond thankful. The rain had finished when I got back to the bridge. I stopped on the first wooden plank panting from running so hard. My heart froze in fear when I didn't see the creature or Max. Creatures always kept their deals. I shouldn't be so worried. They may worm their way out of some, taking advantage of the deal's wording, but I had until sunrise. They should be here. Right when I was about to start panicking, the flaming face appeared from the dark bridge as the rest of its body came into view. Max was still being dragged along, and I tightened my grip on the handle of my new blade. Oh, now where did you get a blade like that? It's dangerous for humans like you. It can cut nearly anything. You really shouldn't be playing with that. I'll give you what you want. In exchange, you'll let Max go free. You won't hurt him in any way and let me get the hell out of here. What an interesting deal. If you can give me the flesh I want, your friend can leave unharmed. That sweet voice made my skin crawl. I couldn't stand hearing it again. I also couldn't hesitate any longer. If I did, I would lose my nerve. Tripping off my soaking uniform jacket and long sleeve shirt, I put the blade under my left arm and the shoulder. I didn't know how much a human arm weighed. I really hoped it was at least five pounds. Since getting this job, I had started lifting weights, but my arms were still on the scrawny side. I counted the three, two, and with three. one last look at my friend, I pushed the blade upwards. It didn't hurt. I must have been in shock. I heard a thump of the severed arm hitting the wood below and a rush of warmth down my side. The blade dropped from my hand, my head becoming light from the instant blood loss. It was only then I thought I was going to die. If the bleeding wasn't stopped soon, that would be it. At least, I would die without facing the shame of admitting to Max I was dying a virgin. I wish I had someone in my life who could nuke my browser history so my father wouldn't see it. I was seconds away from collapsing when I heard a shrill, horrible laugh. The creature I had made a deal with was cackling away as if it had just seen the funniest thing in its life. At least someone was enjoying this. Oh, let me help you out. It said between laughs. Its large, clawed hand burst into flames. I was unable to stop it from pressing it against my bleeding shoulder. I screamed from the flash of white-hot pain. I only lasted a few seconds smelling my own flesh cooking and hearing it sizzle. I passed out thinking I wasn't ever going to wake up again. I really wished I hadn't opened my eyes. Everything felt heavy. 
It was impossible to sit up for a few minutes. I went from sleeping and waking for a few minutes until I could finally move my head. I was in some sort of medical area that in a way looked like a school nurse's office with a few beds beside each other. Groaning, I sat up a little on my pillow trying to make sense of things. My shoulder was wrapped in some bandages with that strange language Max had used for his circle spells. I expected it to hurt more. I didn't even see any burn scars. They must have hooked me up with some good magic or drugs to make me feel decent enough after losing an arm. Someone sat on a chair next to my bed. They didn't even look up from a book when I moved. I couldn't read the writing on the cover, but based on the illustration, it was some sort of trashy romance book. They didn't look like a doctor or a nurse. I didn't recognize them and thought we never met before. Their hair was white that faded into a bright red. It flowed over them and touched the floor. I was guessing they were female, but it was hard to judge under the bundles of fabrics. When they looked up, I was shocked by just how beautiful of a face was looking at me. Red eyes watched me for a few seconds. Nice to see you're alive. You humans are so fragile. I didn't know who or what this person was, but I felt like I had heard the voice before. They took away your blade. It's too important of an item for a human to own. That Slithers creature's gotten a bit of trouble for creating it and giving it to you and leaving some old trash just sitting in the middle of a hiking trail for any human to find. You should really make it up to them. However, what no one can understand is why you offered up your arm. You had a blade that can cut through nearly anything three times. Why not attack the creature and take your friend back? The person gave me a blinding smile that made me feel like the world's biggest idiot. Why didn't I attack the thing in front of me? I had a weapon and it even said it could cut through anything. I let out a groaned pain coming to my temple and my face flushed. Still, even if I did attack, I was still human. I might not have been able to get a hit in. Even if I did, some monsters didn't die if you cut them in half. Attacking was an option, but sacrificing myself was the safer of ideas. It might not have worked. My voice was weak from my injury and from a very dry throat. The person beside me let out a loud cackle enjoying my answer. (laughs) Humans are so interesting. I am glad I'll be able to see what other kind of nonsense you have in store. They stood up, towering over me. I still had no clue who they were, but I was still more worried if Max made it out alright. I didn't see him in the room. Is Max... Your partner is fine. As you have found out, our world is based on deals and favors instead of money you humans used. A favor from a more powerful creature is worth more. I promise I would deliver mail for a year in exchange for you to receive an arm. Do not get your hopes up. You should not be able to feel temperature with this arm or have any kind of grip strength. You gave up your left arm. That fact shall always be truth. What can be given to you is something like a very good prosthetic. I felt my heart race at those words. I had accepted dying, now I was being told someone I didn't know gave up a year of their life to help me out. I didn't understand why. I do appreciate that, but who are you? Instead of being offended, they only smiled. A sinister looking smile that made me very uncomfortable. Oh, do you recognize me now? As they spoke, their entire body shifted, and the image of a beautiful face fell away into flames in a dark figure. The thing from the bridge stood over me as I felt the heat of the flames on my face. I let out a high-pitched shriek trying to get far away from the thing. More shrill laughter as the more manageable face form came back. Please keep entertaining me, human. If you don't, I may eat up the rest of you. If I could gain such a perfect form from only your arm, think of what I would become if I ate the rest. I did not like that idea. My body protested against being alive in the moment. I did not want to let my guard down in front of this monster. I had no choice in the matter. The sudden movement took everything out of me and I passed out again. I was being treated by the postal company and didn't see much of Max. Rufus dropped by to check up on me and to tell me Max was just fine. He was forced into a nap on the bridge while I came out of it missing an arm. I was told Max would drop by when he had time. There was a sudden influx of mail deliveries, so he was needed on the field. Rufus also didn't want him to see me missing my arm because when Max got upset, it was very hard to cheer him up again. I was perfectly fine with that. I didn't want him to see me worn out and in pain. I was not alright with the fact Rufus let slip. 
Apparently, I was the talk of the company because I had gone on literally the easiest job and came back nearly dead. Most just thought it amusing, but I knew I was never going to live this down. Replacing an arm on a human wasn't something they normally had to do, but it worked out. I really didn't want to know where they got the arm though. As promised, I couldn't feel hot or cold things. I could barely hold anything in my left hand. I was told if I kept working at it, I would gain some strength back. I would never be at 100% again with that hand. Honestly, I was alright with that. Max got out safe. It was well worth the cost of an arm. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be stuck in the sorting room for a while. Putting me out onto the field is just bad luck. I really didn't want to go out for another delivery job fearing the worst. When I let these fears slip in front of Rufus, he just gave me a beaming smile, saying they already had some jobs lined up for me and Max. I know he was trying to comfort me. Bless him. He tried his best, but he wasn't really helping. I really wished my coworkers would start treating me like an adult. I work as a mailman for cryptids, and that meant I worked alongside strange supernatural creatures with their own rules and cultures. Every time I felt like I made some progress in understanding their world, I would fail, taking a million steps back. Due to an injury, I was stuck in the sorting room for a month. It was an easy job of just sorting through the mountain of colored envelopes to place in the right cubby for delivery. The injury was from cutting off my own arm to save my delivery partner. My work provided me a new one that had its issues, still it worked well enough. After all the mistakes I made in the past, I really didn't blame them for never letting me go back out in the field, but I wished the creatures I worked with stopped treating me like a fragile child. Humans are much weaker, that's true. However, I did not like the spider creature of a co-worker taking the piles of envelopes from my hands, fearing too many of them was far too heavy for my weak human arms. I was very thankful for not only getting the arm, but keeping my job after my constant mistakes. My co-workers still drooled and treated me like a hunk of meat. I think if they could, they would wrap me up in bubble wrap. After a few days, I started to take notice of the different creatures in my area. I had a system of sorting to make my job go faster. Still, with their help, I found my area being done before the others. Since I was still on the clock, I went over to assist whoever I could find who would have me. Strangely enough, with everyone working together, we did sort through all of the envelopes on a slow day. I had never seen the back room empty and sorted before. I don't think any of them had either. My suspicions of them seeing me as weak and needed to be treated with extreme care was confirmed by one of the creatures that could speak my language. She was the one who I gave up my arm in exchange for the safe return of Max, my partner. A very beautiful and very tall woman that joined the postal service for a year to just mess with me. Under her pretty mask was a terrifying creature I never wanted to see again. She dropped by the sorting room and gave my shoulder a playful shove. She thought it was playful, but it could have crushed me if I didn't make a habit of wearing my magic uniform that protected me from damage every time I left the house. How is the new arm, tiny baby man? To my horror, she explained that everyone was now calling me the tiny baby man. I couldn't understand their language, and for two weeks they had been calling me that straight to my face. Help me think of a name, tiny baby. Should I be Belizus or Belus? I think you should be out of my area. I gained a bit of confidence in dealing with creatures like her. I found a broom and shoved her away so I could keep sorting. I heard she had been trying to decide on a human name for two weeks. The creatures I worked with had their common name and then a name humans could pronounce. Most went without a human name because they never needed to speak with one aside from eating them. So when they needed one, they would either pick a random name or a word that described their main quality. Some, like this annoying woman trying to delay my work, just made up a name they liked the sound of. By some miracle, I received a message that I was needed for a delivery job. I really didn't think it was best to put me out in the field again, but I was dying of embarrassment in the sorting room. I received the message at the start of my sorting shift, so I went to the meeting room instead. The postal company could create rooms that looked like empty office spaces whenever they needed in order to have a receptionist pass off the job to the ones delivering it. They were called zero rooms. They could create a doorway to anywhere on the planet to drop the ones doing the job close by the area where they needed to be. I was always a bit annoyed that at the end of the jobs I was never dropped off close by my apartment. I was always a few blocks away. I bet they could drop me off right in front of my place after a long day. I never brought it up, fearing I would be walking a bit more on the way home the next job. 
The receptionists all looked the same. I was trying to keep track of them by their slight hairstyle differences and gum preferences. I thought one of them was named Sleen, but I wasn't sure. They all outright refused to answer any personal questions when I had a moment to ask. When I entered the room, I was tackled to the ground by my partner. We hadn't seen each other since I lost my arm. Max was a very high-spirited person, but I heard when he was feeling down, it was a difficult task cheering him up again. I had no idea how he was doing since we last worked together. I let him rant in his language and hug me so tight I thought I would break in half. Realizing he could be hurting me, Max lifted me back onto my feet. Let me eat your legs so we're never separated again. Max was holding my shoulders, his nose a few inches away from mine. He spoke in such a low tone and with an intense look, I knew his request was not even remotely close to a joke. I needed to think of something or else my partner was going to rip my leg off and eat it. Uh, maybe my pinky toe when I'm emotionally ready to give it up. An unbelievably long and intense moment passed between us. His bright yellow eyes stared into mine. I really didn't think I was going to get out of that room in one piece. Finally, Max smiled and let go of my shoulders, looking like he accepted my offer. His teeth were a sharp reminder that if he wanted to, he could rip my leg off with no issue. We went over to the receptionist, ready to receive our job details, after I gave her some gum I stashed away in my jacket pocket for her. She placed a small package on the table and, to my shock, gave a look of utter disgust towards it. She barely even looked up at me any time we talked to her. I'd never seen so much emotion on her face before. You need to deliver this to Trin in the maze. She pushed the package towards me, trying to touch it as little as possible. Normally we would call our clients Miss, Mr, or Honored. I never heard of a creature not having that respect given to them before. Max always scooped up the packages before I could move. This time he didn't make any motions to touch it. His face was twisted in the same kind of disgust, like a child who was being forced to eat some bitter vegetables. Is this trend that bad? I asked as I grabbed the package to put away in my pocket. Well... They both started at once trying to think of the right words. She's difficult, Max said finally after thinking. She really likes humans so you'll have no issue with her. Every time I was told an easy job was going to happen, I ended up in a horrible mess. I prayed this would be an easy quick delivery. I wanted one job to go smoothly. Maybe if I could deal with a creature none of them wanted to be around, I would get some credit back on my name. Max dragged his feet to the exit. I didn't think he had it in him to be so down. He always shared the same energetic happiness of the dog he shared some physical features of. Because of my very bad first experience in the maze, I shouldn't be the one dragging my feet. I opened the door, expecting to see the same sight the last time I entered the horrible place. But to another surprise, I didn't see the inside of a building beyond the door. The door opened to a field of golden corn instead. A warm breeze pushed through, and washed clouds drift by on an orange sunset. It was the nicest place we ever arrived in. I knew the maze changed every time someone entered it, but I wasn't expecting ten feet tall corn as far as the eye can see. Seeing such a sight made me think we really were just going to have an easy job. Then Achoo. Max started to sneeze Achoo. beside me. He just wouldn't stop. His eyes started to water, and he backed away from the door, nearly tripping over his own paws. I can't, he sputtered between sneezing. I knew his sense of smell was better than mine. I wondered what about this field bothered his senses so much. I'm allergic. You'll have to go alone. It was a wonder he got the words out between his sudden sneezing fit. It looked like he was suffering from the door just being open. There was no way he could do this job with me, but I couldn't go alone. No one went alone. It was just proven that it's safer to go in pairs, easy job or not. After all, I lost an arm, and we had done the easiest job the postal company had. I can't. Something might... I started, but Max pushed me forward through the door. No one else will work with you. That fact hurt a little. Let me get something for my allergies. I'll come after you in an hour. Without letting me protest, Max closed the door on me. It remained an office door just in the middle of a cornfield. I knew it was still unlocked, and I could go back through it if I wanted. Still, Max had faith I would be fine. Most jobs, we just sat and waited for our client to show up to pick up their mail. An hour on my way should be fine. I turned away from the door, finding a trail in the corn, and started to walk. I just needed to keep telling myself I would be fine. For the first time ever, I didn't need to wait on a client. 
Of course, the one time I wanted it to be the case, they were waiting for me to arrive. Our clients could literally take any form. Some had been so mind-numbingly terrifying, I couldn't even look at them when Max made them sign for their delivery. It's impossible to know what you are going to meet and could only hope for something you could handle. After a few minutes of walking, the trail ended in an area the corn was cut down in a large circle. A large comfortable chair sat in the middle and the client beside it. The sun hadn't set yet, the entire area was still bathed in the orange golden light. I almost didn't notice Trin at first, she was a simple creature and yet still very unnerving to look at. A faceless mask floated beside the chair with a cloth so sheer it was nearly transparent draped over it. When the wind fluttered, the cloth looked like it was pressing against an invisible woman's body. Seeing a blank white mask looking over in my direction triggered my body into flight mode. I'd seen more awful creatures before, I couldn't explain why that mask got under my skin in the way it did. I just wanted to drop the package and book it out of there. Uh, Miss Trin, I have... I stopped speaking to let out a yelp and stumbled back. In a blink of an eye, the mask had went from in the middle of the clearing to right in front of my face. You little thing, you look tired, such a hard job. Here, have a rest. The cloth fluttered as I saw a shape of a hand taking me by the arm. I was forced into a sitting position and, to my confusion, into the chair that was in the middle of the circle. I hadn't walked over, and yet I was sitting a few feet from where I arrived. Easy job, my ass. Warning bells rang in my head. I needed to get the job done and leave as soon as possible. Trin may like humans, but she may like them in all the wrong ways. Look at what they have done to your arm. Such a horrible sight. Nothing ever comes from humans being around those sorts of creatures. It's a pity you did not come sooner. Why don't you stay here for a while? I wanted to speak. I needed to tell her that I was just here to drop off her mail. Aside from the constant stress, threats of being killed or eaten and cutting off my own arm, my job wasn't that bad. After all, I could be in customer service. I remember reaching for my pocket for the package trying to finish the job. Then I was simply not there. I wasn't a mailman dealing with supernatural creatures, I was back to being a child in the middle of summer vacation. I didn't know about any scary things that went bump in the night. My only fears were of the fact summer may end someday and I would be forced back into school. I heard a voice calling me inside, away from my pretend adventures for lunch. Even though it was a hot day, my mother had made my favorite, a grilled cheese sandwich with a silly smiling face made of ketchup. I happily ate my lunch not a care in the world. It was only when I looked over at my mother when I snapped out of whatever dream I entered in. I couldn't see her face. That was because she had been gone for so many years. With a pained yelp, I shot out of the chair. I collapsed on the ground so exhausted my eyes almost refused to stay open. I sat up on my elbows trying to shake the fog from my mind. What the hell did Trin just do to me? You should go back to sleep. Weren't you having a nice dream? I looked up at her blank face, disgusted by her. My mother is gone. How dare you drag that back up? I hissed at her, my anger keeping me awake. Out of all the creatures I'd come across, I disliked her most for reminding me of the thing that still hurt me so much. Oh, my poor dear. She may be gone for you now, but if you stay, you can have her back. You can have a perfectly lovely life with nothing bad ever happening to you. You only need to stay here with me and dream. The mask floated down to my level and I felt the cloth brushing against my skin. I was so tired the moment arms wrapped around me my body fell limp. I still kept my eyes open but only barely. I was losing the battle against this monster. I would admit it did sound tempting, just dreaming instead of doing my dangerous job. I eat the nightmares of humans. All you need to do is sleep. You're so precious to me. All of the humans under my care are. Don't worry, you'll have an endless wonderful dream. Just stay here. I felt myself relaxing and losing the battle. I so badly just wanted to fall asleep and take her up on that offer. No more threatening co-workers. No more waiting to see if the next delivery job would be my last. I could just stay there and maybe be able to see what my mother's face looked like again. I thought of Max and found a bit more strength to stay awake. I was sure he would understand if I stayed because I would be happy there. What would I even dream about? 
Would I only be a carefree kid, or could I see Max and Rufus? Yes, they were strange creatures that only on the surface looked partly human. I still didn't want a life without them. Rufus nearly died for me, and Max looked so worried after not seeing each other for a month, we'd become friends. Who cares if we were different species? I felt Trin bristle at my sleepy question. No, there is no room in my world for those horrible things. I'll remove any kind of creature from your mind. You'll never have to think of them again. The arms tightened around me so they no longer felt like a kind embrace, but a choking attack. The sudden shift got me back to my senses, pulling through the mental fog and cotton feeling in my muscles. I pushed out of the sheer fabric wrapped around me. Forcing myself away from Trin, I suddenly felt like I'd run a marathon. My lung felt close to bursting and my head light. She had offered me a good deal until she revealed she would remove my only real friends I ever made in my life. You're refusing me. Trin asked, her voice so cold it felt like it cut into me. Yes, now please take your package and sign for it. I took the small package out from my jacket and the small slip of paper attached to it fluttered. I didn't feel very brave sitting on the ground looking up at her. I looked and felt awful, but at the same time was a little proud for standing up for myself. I really thought she was going to kill me. It was impossible to read what kind of emotion she had with her blank face. Sweat rolled down my face as I kept the package held out for her until my arms started to tremble and hurt. Fine, you'll come back to me someday. Most do. I still think you're a precious little thing. Cloth shifting, she took the package and out from thin air, a fountain pen appeared. She wrote a quick little symbol representing her common name. For some reason, she handed the package back to me after it was signed for. We did not need to return the signed paper. It had a spell on it that made the paper disappear off to the records room after the client signed for it. I ordered this for you. Once I heard a human was working for the postal company, I requested you deliver this to me. On the off chance you refused my offer, I found something to help you stay alive until you returned to me. I shouldn't have been that surprised Trin gave me a gift. Creatures such as herself worked off a favor-based system. Gifts were not part of their culture, but they all saw me as so weak and helpless, I found a few of them and started to hand out freebies to keep me alive. I slowly opened the package, expecting a knife or a holy relic, anything suitable to fight against creatures of the night. It's a flashlight. I stated the obvious. It's a sunlight. Trin explained in a patient tone. After using it, you must charge it for a full day in the sun. Two days for the winter. Creatures cannot handle the sun very well. If you turn it on, it shall bring out a burst of light so bright it could kill very weak and very lesser creatures. For stronger ones, it shall blind them, letting you get away. Well, that was useful. I wish I owned this a month ago. I need to remember to be careful using it around Max. I was sure this thing would blind him too. Thank you. I said, standing up, suddenly feeling a little embarrassed by her kindness. You could repay me by staying. I think I hear my partner calling for me. I need to go. It wasn't the most graceful way to leave a conversation, but it was the only idea I got. I wasn't stopped as I walked across the clearing. You can also repay me by staying alive. Humans that encounter supernatural creatures nearly always die by them. I fear you don't have a lot of time left. Please make the right choice and come back to me. I paused at the edge of the trail to look over my shoulder at her. I wondered how many humans she'd taken under her spell, if she had some sleeping right as we spoke. If it was their choice, I guess it was fine. She wasn't as cruel as other monsters I came across. People were waiting for me to return. I felt like taking her up on her endless dream offer would be selfish on my part. I would stick with my awful job because I was doing it together with a friend. I won't die anytime soon. I have a pinky promise to keep. I could have sworn her blank mask held a confused expression for a few seconds I walked away leaving her behind. I had no idea how long I had been gone for. I found the door back to the zero room easy enough. I couldn't have been gone for too long because Max hadn't met me on the trail. When I entered the room, he looked like he was about to charge in after me. Seeing me come out of the door, he froze. I didn't know why he stopped. I closed the door behind me, ready to tell him I finished the job. I saw another new expression on his face when he saw me. 
He looked close to tears. You came back, he said, trying to be strong and not break down from crying. I knew why he had that reaction. Trin had a very good offer. I bet he was certain I would ditch him for her. Max, I cut off my own arm to save you. Of course I would come back. It was meant as a joke, but the receptionist looked like she was going to murder me. Max looked from between her, then to me, and then back to her. We hadn't told him that yet. She hissed at me. Oh no, I wish they would have made me aware of that fact. I couldn't even try and fix my blunder. Max burst out into a fit of tears, grabbing a hold of me, sobbing how sorry he was that I got hurt because of him, even though he wasn't entirely sure what happened that night or why I removed the arm for his sake. I knew Max could kick a person in half if he wanted. It was a bit strange to see someone I viewed to be so upbeat and strong, freely crying. It was so out of character for him, I froze up. I'd heard scraps of information while working in the sorting room about Max. He went from partner to partner, the other creatures not being able to handle his personality being so much like a human. I also heard that 500 years ago, when a mass of creatures was hunted down and killed by humans, gaining access to some spell, he lost his entire family aside from his father, and he once had a huge family. I think Rufus had a lot of children since then, but the mental scars of losing so many important people still lingered in them. The receptionist looked annoyed at her sobbing older brother, and I didn't mind it. I let him cry and soak my uniform jacket. My job was dangerous, my co-workers saw me as a meal. They were mostly creatures of nightmares, and we delivered mail to other nightmare creatures. Any wrong step could cost me my life, or the life of my delivery partner. And in some cases, just dying was the best outcome. Even so, I would stick with this job. I had made the first real friends of my life. Max would always have my back. Rufus would gladly adopt me if I let him. And even that very annoying and very frightening witch of a woman that made me cut off my arm to eat was worth sticking around for. I hope Trin wasn't really waiting on me because I don't think I'll ever go to her. For the past few months, I've been able to adjust to my job. My delivery partner was a major stabilizing factor. It was hard to be stressed about other co-workers looking at me as if I was a meal, but Max was literally a big puppy I could spend my work hours with. Sure, I didn't lose an arm and had it replaced with one that slowly started to ache all day, but it was worth trading an arm to keep Max around. I didn't even hold much of a grudge against the creature that made me cut off the arm in the first place. So far, I did not overly regret being forced into my dangerous job of delivering mail to monsters. I came into work feeling ready to get going for a change. I would get texts of door locations to go to and swipe my blank card to get inside what was called the zero room. It looked like an empty office with a fold-out table in the middle and a receptionist. I learned that the receptionists were one of Max's many stepsisters. I have yet to learn all their names or even know just how many he had. Most were pretty frosty personality-wise, but warmed up a little when I slide them a pack or two of gum. They were in charge of giving us the package and details of our delivery jobs. Max was already inside the room and smiled at me when he saw me walk in. He had large dog ears he'd yet to fully grow into. If it wasn't for his mouth full of sharp teeth, his smile would be charming. We have a good job today, he told me, excited and unable to hide his wagging tail. Max always said we had a good job. The last one, we nearly died of heat stroke waiting on the side of a desert highway, waiting for a large slug-like creature to show up and pick up its package. That was a rough one. I made Max spit out so many lizards he tried eating the moment I turned my back. After doing the exchange, Max's sister gestured towards six tote bags filled with letters and packages on the floor. My heart sank. It would take forever to go out and deliver these. Normally, we only did a trip per package. It's all going to the same place. Selene told me, reading my expression. At least I was fairly sure that receptionist was Selene. We get to go see all the girls today. Max explained and started to pick up the totes to hang off his shoulders. He was shorter than me by little, but very strong. I could only carry two of the totes, my bad shoulder unable to support the weight of the third. Max easily took it and carried the rest. I still felt bad that I make him do extra work all the time, and after all these months, couldn't help out more. Max didn't even notice my inner turmoil. He gave his sister a wave, and I followed him out of the door, being weighed down. He needed to keep stopping to wait for me to catch up. 
He knew better than to take over and let me do my best trying to carry the heavy bags. The sun was setting and we walked towards a building that, when I saw the sign, I paused a little confused. Surely we weren't dropping off all this mail at a strip joint. My face, red from embarrassment and the weight of the bags, I tried to catch up to Max. I didn't make it in time. He knocked on the back door of the building and was let inside. Seconds later, before I reached the door, I heard shrieking screams. I was so worried Max walked into something he shouldn't have, I wasn't thinking. I just barged into the back door and into one of the weirdest scenes of my life. The door opened into an employee dressing area. It felt like it was poor planning that someone walking inside could see the girls getting ready. Max was surrounded by women, all different species and all in different stages of undress. My face turned completely red and I did my very best not to look at anything I felt like I was not meant to see. Until that moment, Max never really showed any interest in girls before. He treated everyone with the same bright and kind, bubbly personality. So I was shocked to see him in the middle of the women looking like he was very much enjoying himself as they all spoke in a mixture of languages. Then I realized he wasn't enjoying himself because of a lot of attractive girls fawning over him. He was smiling away and wagging his tail because a bunch of people were petting his head and touching his paw like hands. I felt jealous. For months I wanted to touch the soft pads on Max's hands but didn't, fearing I would be dragged into a work sensitivity training program. I suffered being unable to touch the beans and all these girls were just going at it. I knew that it would take a while for them to all settle down and I stepped aside trying to find a spot to put the tote bags to be sorted through later. When I looked up, I was staring at a face I never thought I would see again. We both stared at each other, frozen, the sounds of the other girls chattering around us. Vicky? I asked, finally. She came towards me, looking like she was about to rip me to pieces. Before she could reach me, a different woman came over between us. She was tall and had a slit mouth that went from ear to ear. Aside from that, she was rather pretty. Oh... I heard a human was delivering mail, Vixen. Do you know it? You talk to humans. The woman asked, mouth in a wide smile. We talked a few times on a dating site but never met. Right, Toby? We never met, right? Vicky's tone was very clear on what she wanted me to say. I nodded, a little nervous on what would happen if I said otherwise. Vicky was the reason why I got my job. She was a monster that would eat men she went on dates with. We did meet through a dating site, but I was spared. She could only eat certain types of men, it seemed. She still tried to kill me, but I was lucky enough to, literally, run into the Silver King. Sure, she tried to eat me, but I've forgiven her for that. If I had a grudge against everything that had tried, I wouldn't have any friends left. Vera, why don't you help Max get the mail out to everyone? Vicky suggested. The tall woman smiled and nodded. She pushed her way through the crowd and soon the girls were getting back on task. Max was still in the middle of getting mail together and making them sign a sheet once he handed them their packages. He was chattering in different languages I've never heard him use before. Vicky and myself stood awkwardly off to the side. I'm kinda useless here, huh? I commented, watching Max work. Mostly, yeah, but I think it's alright. Max had been delivering our mail for years. He's ideal because he's friendly and knows a lot of languages, but he's always switching partners. His personality is so close to a human, it's off-putting to creatures of the night. It's... It's a good thing he's working with you. Vicky told me, looking as awkward as I felt. I had no idea Max switched partners so often. Here I thought everyone loved him. It made sense, him and Rufus, his father, were much different than all the other creatures I've come across so far. At first, Vicky felt like she was similar to them, but then she chased me through the woods trying to kill me. Max came over to retrieve the last few bags and took my hand. Come meet all the girls. I was dragged forward and shoved in the same spot Max was minutes before. I had a gaggle of supernatural females prodding me and pinching my cheeks. It wasn't entirely unpleasant. Max was trying to introduce me to them all, but some didn't have human names. In the future, I may remember how their names sounded, but would find it impossible to pronounce. At least they were friendly, and only a few looked as if they were seconds away from taking a bite out of me. A man came peeking into the room and said something I didn't understand. The girl started to disperse to get fully dressed. I got some quick kisses on my cheeks, but felt as if it was the same way you would kiss a cute animal. In the chaos, Vicky was getting her mail from Max. Do you work here? I asked her, and Vicky stared daggers at me. 
Do I look like I work here? She hissed. I felt my blood turn cold knowing I asked the wrong questions. Below are apartments for female creatures only. I live here, doofus. She was being a bit grumpy with me. I imagine I would be the last person she ever wanted to see again considering how our date ended. Unable to read the room, Max came in with a save. Let's all go out on a date. We both did a double take at this suggestion. Max didn't know a lot about human culture, but I thought he knew what a date was. Do you mean you want us all to go out for dinner? Vicky corrected. Yeah, you told me about a place that makes breakfast stuff all day the last time I brought mail. I've never had breakfast before. He said, his curved tail wagging, showing how excited he was over the idea. That's just going out for dinner, Max. It's not a date. I told him, but he didn't even falter in his logic. People who like each other going out is a date, and we all like each other, so let's go. He took out hands and started to drag us towards the door. Normally, we would check back into the zero room to say we completed a job. Sometimes we would get a few more jobs to do, and sometimes we could just head home. I was starting to think Max got away with a lot of things because his entire family worked at the mail company, and because he was cute, that helped a lot. I didn't want to go out with this guy I was meeting tonight anyway. I'll send him a message canceling on him and Toby can pay for my dinner. Vicky said as if she wasn't already planning on going with us the moment Max suggested. Max didn't have any human currency so I was glad my job at least paid well. The all day breakfast diner was a quick walk away. It must do good business being surrounded by bars so the drunks could get some greasy eggs before heading home. It was pretty empty when we arrived. Max sat next to me in a booth and Vicky was across from us. She was texting someone and had her head down when the waitress came by with the menus. I've been working with Max for a few months and yet I've never gotten a clear answer about how other people saw him. He did have dog features. Could humans see his ears and just assume they were fake? Or did they see him as a normal person? I had a lot of questions but when Vicky put her phone down, I suddenly was unable to speak. She was a very pretty girl. Long red hair she styled in flowing waves since the last time I'd seen her. When she smiled, she had hints of dimples and her clothing always seemed to fit in just the right way. Almost any guy could be easily lured in by her looks. She was the best looking girl I've ever spent time with, but I felt no attraction towards her. I remember what she truly looked like. Every time I looked at her, I felt the memory of her hot breath on the back of my neck as she was just about to crush me in her massive jaws. Max didn't notice how tense I was or how awkward the air turned. He reached over and took a hold of one of the small syrup jugs and opened it a few times. He snickered. There was two of them and the spout looked like a bird's face. These look like chook chooks, he said, opening and closing the jug. Oh, they really do. Vicky reached over and started to do the same. I had no idea what they were talking about but they looked like they were enjoying an inside joke. In a squawking voice, she spoke while making the jug look like it was talking. The thousand year pitch war, never heard of it, never started it. Her and Max cackled at something I would never really understand without at least a few hundred years of supernatural creature history for context. They both started to squawk and talk about a war I had no idea about before I needed to get them settled down. Alright you two, pick out what you want. Max, you can try anything you like. I told him, full knowing I would regret those words. Max looked at me, eyes shining, and started to go over the menu we were sharing. He would read something out loud and ask me about it. There were a few things Max couldn't eat, like grapes or onions, so I needed to keep an eye out on what human foods he ordered. He was reading the menu just fine, and I was impressed by the fact that English wasn't his first language. He must be pretty smart if he could learn so many, even if he proved otherwise sometimes. When we ordered, Max pointed to what he wanted and I told the waitress, Vicky ordered two large meal combos and our waitress raised an eyebrow over the sheer amount of food. Regardless, she wrote everything down and was on her way. So, Toby, what have you been up to? Vicky asked and sipped on the coffee she ordered. I started to tell her of everything that had happened so far with my new job, with Max helping me with some of the details. She, like most people, gave me a dirty look when she found out I was the one who was responsible for Rufus losing a leg and being out of the field for a while. Apparently he was very popular and a few creatures wanted some payback. I needed to be careful of where I showed my face in the future. When our food arrived it nearly didn't fit all on the table. I only ordered some fried eggs, bacon and some toast. I was done eating way before the other two. 
Vicky was good at taking over my job of making sure Max didn't eat some grapes that had been mixed in with his other fresh fruit. When I was finished eating, I snatched away some home fries that was mixed together with some onions. The potatoes were big enough to separate and give back to Max, who was shoving waffles into his face and didn't even notice our rescue efforts. Oddly enough, after chatting with Vicky, my weariness of her eased. I thought it would take me more time to no longer be afraid of her. I still wasn't attracted to her, but I no longer felt the urge to bolt whenever I saw her smiling. I really did forgive her, but my body refused to want to stay around something it knew to be a predator. Overall, it was a nice dinner out that was almost worth the hit to my bank account. Somehow, they both got through the mountain of food. We went up to the front to pay, and I left a good tip, feeling sorry for whoever needed to collect our dishes. I'm going to the bathroom, Max announced. Okay, but only for five minutes. I told him. Vicky gave me a look, wondering why I was limiting his washroom break time. He likes to stick his head under those hand dryers. If you don't tell him a time limit, he'll do it for hours. She nodded, understanding how Max can be. We left to wait for him outside. Vicky was getting some texts, so she was looking at her phone while she spoke to me. Have you been donating blood recently? She asked. It was a bit of an odd question to ask out of the blue. I stood looking at her, wondering why she would ask. I did in fact donate some in the past few days. After the incident where I lost my arm and the mailing company replaced it, I was outed as still being a virgin. My flesh and blood are highly coveted by creatures of the night. By eating it or drinking it, they can become stronger. Or so I've heard. And I heard it could be used to heal some of my co-workers if they get harmed in the field. I really didn't mind donating to help out, so I started to do it as much as I was able. Yes, how did you know? I asked her, wondering if Max told her and I wasn't paying attention. A friend of mine was attacked by hunters and nearly died. She never harmed a human before, but you know hunters, they'll kill anything not human. Anyway, your blood saved her. She might even be able to grow her horns back. I think she isn't the only one you've saved, and I wasn't sure if anyone thanked you yet. She was sounding so kind and honest, I didn't know how to deal with it. I felt my face flush, and I looked away from her, embarrassed. I didn't feel as if I've done anything worthy of being praised for. Anyone in my position should have done the same thing. I knew donating my blood was going to help, but never thought of just how much before. Without warning, Vicky put her phone back into her pocket and leaned over to kiss my cheek. I froze, face red. I shouldn't have been so shocked before the whole trying to eat me thing, Vicky and I got along just fine. She was a nice person, I still wouldn't date her though. God, you're such a... Vicky didn't finish whatever she was going to say to tease me. A man around our age I didn't recognize got out of his car and was walking towards us in a rage. Vicky knew him and her face twisted in a snarl. He stopped a few steps in front of us, so angry he was out of breath. I knew Vicky could handle it, but I still stood between her and the newcomer. You bitch, after everything you go behind my back and sleep around with this guy, he's not even that good looking. The man spat. I wasn't hurt by his comment, I knew I wasn't a catch and the monsters I worked alongside were kind enough not to say so. Just because you buy me shit I never asked for doesn't mean you're entitled to me or my time, and I'm not sleeping around with Toby, he's a friend you extreme dumbass. She shot back getting out in front of me ready to throw down if needed. At first, I thought I would need to save this guy from her, until he angrily brought out a gun and pointed it at both of us. Even after months of being around monsters, the sight of a gun still made me cold. Because my job was dangerous, we received magic uniforms that could stop claws and bullets. I was wearing mine, still sort of being on the job, but the uniforms only protected what they covered. If he shot me in the face, it was all over. Vicky stopped talking and looked over at me fear in her eyes. Drop your phone and get into the car, now. His tone gave no room for arguments. I took my phone covered in the pink case I received for work and dropped it to the ground. I winced as it bounced away. Vicky did the same. She could have ripped this guy apart, but I knew creatures of the night were bound by certain rules when it came to killing humans. She either didn't want to attack him in a public space, or, for some reason, couldn't fight back at all. Max would be useful to have around, it was already way past 5 minutes. If I lived, I might have to be angry with him. We both listened to the man and was led to his car. He made Vicky get into the front and I sat in the back. My mind was racing trying to think of something to do. I needed to wait until he stopped the car to fight back. I didn't want to endanger Vicky by risking an accident by attacking the man while he drove. I flexed and gripped my left hand, 
feeling pain shoot through my entire arm if I gripped my hand too tightly. The replacement arm was pretty weak, and with the new pain, I couldn't do much with it. I had no confidence in myself and only prayed Vicky had a plan. Or that Max noticed us missing soon and came to our rescue, I doubted the second option. We drove in silence for a while. He pulled into a normal looking suburb and forced us inside a house. The entire time he kept the gun on Vicky and had one of her arms in his hand. I walked in front, opening the door as he told me, fearing he would hurt her if I didn't do something. He clearly only planned on taking Vicky and was stressed trying to deal with a second person. When we got inside the front door, I couldn't take it any longer. I grabbed a glass bowl off a table by the front door, ready to use it as a weapon, as the keys and spare change inside went flying. I swung around, aiming for his face, and got foreseeable results. He was much faster and slammed the handgun into my nose. I dropped the bowl, breaking it into thousands of pieces on the ground. He gave my stomach a kick and that didn't hurt but still knocked me over. I was about to get up to keep fighting when I saw Vicky's expression. She was silently pleading for me to stay down. I did. My face a mass of throbbing pain and nose bleeding, our kidnapper wasted no time and nearly dragged us both down into his basement. I let him shove me into a chair and didn't struggle when he tied my hands behind my back and my ankles together. I felt sick looking around his basement, it was any creep's dream. A mattress was on the floor with blankets scattered around, he had stacks of blank DVD cases piled around the room and a computer on the floor next to the mattress. It smelled and looked like he lived down here. He only had zip ties left to keep Vicky in check. Securing her wrists, he gave me a few threats before heading up the stairs for whatever reason. What's the plan? I whispered over to her and tried to struggle free. Are you going to eat him or something? She gave me a disgusted look. Who would ever want to be in the same room as that guy, let alone eat him? I can't kill or eat men who haven't done anything wrong. This piece of human waste is a virgin. Unlike you, he's very bitter about it. It was only a matter of time before he snapped like this. I have no idea why he dragged you along. She replied, not bothering to whisper. Wait, so what are we going to do? I can't win against him with a bad arm. Can't you defend yourself? Bad arm? They didn't replace it with something good? What a ripoff. And no, I can't. I'm not human and my self-defense is killing. I guess we just let him do something to me so I can bite his head off. I was nearly sick at the thought. It wasn't just the idea of Vicky having this guy put his hand on her in any way, but the casual way she said it. I suddenly wondered how many times she'd been in this situation, where she lured in dangerous men who hadn't done anything yet so she let herself become the scapegoat so she could punish them based on her rules. I shook my head, trying to get my dinner to stay down. No matter what happened, that was not an option. No, we're not letting him touch you. I'll bite out his throat if I need to. I tried to sound as tough as a guy tied down could. Toby, he'll kill you. Why bother risking your life when we can go with the easier option? The easier option isn't the right one. Risking my life is well worth you not having to go through something like that. I stared at her, her expression turning into a confused one. She looked at me as if I was crazy. In her eyes, I was. This is how she lived her life, regardless of how she felt about it. Are you white knighting me? She asked, eyebrows still raised. What? No, I... Maybe, I, but I don't mean it like that. You're my friend. I don't want anything to happen to you. Her expression changed as we heard our kidnapper make noise above us. He was going to come back any minute, and I still didn't officially have a plan. I was talking a big game, but didn't have any kind of power to back it up. I really wish I didn't let Max go fool around with the hand dryer. We could really use his help right now. I felt pretty pathetic that I couldn't even defend myself against a human. It was a miracle that I survived so many months of being around creatures of the night if some rope in a chair was enough to get me into a pickle. The basement door opened and we both looked over at each other, not deciding on what to do yet. The man came down the stairs, a bag over his shoulder. It looked like he packed in a hurry. He clearly was going to grab Vicky and make a quick getaway, leaving what he was going to do with me a mystery for a few seconds. Dropping his bag in front of her, he turned towards me, the gun at his side. You need to cut your losses and just turn yourself in. You took two people in front of a diner. With all the drunks around, I'm sure they have cameras. Save yourself a lot of trouble and just quit while you're ahead. I said, hoping we were not past the talking stage. We were way beyond the talking stage. Oh, you're trying to order me around, huh? You think because you're a hot Japanese guy you can take my girl and tell me what to do? He snarled at me. My mother was Korean. 
I corrected and it just made his face flush red in rage. He was beyond any kind of rational thought and has been for a long time. I started to try and pull at the ropes keeping my wrists together but they were far too tight. I felt that if I had two working arms I might have had a chance at overpowering this guy. He looked pale and weak from being a basement dweller. Since you're calling the shots, I'm going to let you pick what you want to happen. I can do whatever I want with her while you watch, or I can just shoot you in the face and leave with Vicky. What is it going to be? He threatened, his eyes narrowing in hate towards me. Vicky started to speak at the same time as I did. She was putting on an act, pleading for him to not hurt me and how sorry she was that she was out with another guy. I was pulling in the ropes, calling him any kind of vile name I could think of to get him to keep his attention on me. I would much rather get shot in the face than watch a friend getting assaulted without being able to do a damn thing about it. A few minutes passed and the man screamed in frustration, hands over his ears trying to drown us out. Finally, he fired one shot into the ceiling to shut us up. We sat, tense, waiting for him to act. My stomach twisted in stress. I'd been in a few scary situations before and seen some terrible monsters, but I'd never felt so stressed and afraid before. Death was easy. Living through the regret that I couldn't save a friend was worse. The gun was pointed at my face and I felt relieved and scared at the same time. I didn't know the extent of Vicky's rule and thought maybe she could kill murderers as well and not just human trash that forced themselves on girls. The gun was trembling in his hand and he looked like he was going to be sick. The gravity of what he'd done and what he was going to do finally hit him. He could either crumple under the pressure or go all in. My throat tightened and I suddenly couldn't get air to my lungs. I thought about Max and how upset he would be to have to get a new partner again. For a brief moment, I wondered if it was worth putting him through that to help Vicky. The gun went off and I thought I was dead. My mind worked slowly, the events of what just happened taking a while to catch up. My ear was burning because the gun was fired so close to my head. At the last second, the shot went aside, saving my brains from splattering. My ear rang and I stared in shock at how I was saved. Vicky easily pulled her wrist free. She jumped up from behind the man, her face transformed and twisted. She clamped her jaws on his neck, blood sprang into my face and she moved the gun aside just enough to save me. With one final crushing twist of her jaws, she let the man fall limp and bloody to the floor. Her face returned to its normal pretty version. She noticed my expression of shock and horror and looked as if it was not a normal reaction. What? She asked, slightly put out, I wasn't keeping track of what was going on. You just... you can't. You'll get in trouble again. I stuttered. She made short work of my bonds and lifted me out of the chair with one hand. Because I was unable to really do much due to shock, she started to clean the blood from my face. Creatures of the night can kill a human if it's to save a different human, but no one does it because... gross. None of us take advantage of the rule to eat whatever we want because of... just... It's wrong for us to meddle in human affairs. If you want to kill each other, go for it. So Toby, this is very important. You can't tell anyone I saved you. Her tone was low and serious. I looked over at her face that still looked human, but it gave me the chills just to look over at her. Or else, I started to ask. Or else, she said, not needing to finish the threat. Nodding, we left the basement and the man behind. She would come back later to dispose of the evidence, but right now we needed to find Max and fill him in. Turns out, he found us. When we came out of the house, Max was walking up the street, his hair a mess. He waved at us and caught up. Vicky gave him a very brief explanation of what happened. He didn't look surprised at all. How did you find us? I asked him finally. Your cell phone has a tracking thing. I looked at him, wondering how that answered the question. I dropped my phone back at the diner, I know I did. Reaching inside my pocket just to double check, I found my phone inside. I pulled it out, very confused on how it got there. Because you can't use spells to get in contact with me in case you get lost, they made it so your phone is always in your pocket. It's pretty immune to damage too. Max explained. He handed Vicky back her phone that he picked up and she looked at the scratch on the corner of her case then looked at my pink case, jealous. I tried texting you, but I guess with your hands tied up, you couldn't answer. Max was just giving me a lot of new information. Since when did he have a phone? When we first met, he didn't even know what one was. You have a cell phone? He pulled one out from his pocket to show it to me. It also had a pink case to match mine. I send you messages all the time, but I don't know how long they take to get through because you never answer me. 
Vicky was snickering at the both of us. Turns out I'd blocked Max's number months ago thinking it was a spam number. I didn't have that many friends that kept in contact with me. Having a random number send me gibberish was a really easy thing to mistake for spam. We figured out how to unblock Max from sending me messages. This would be very useful in the future. Tonight was fun. Kinda lame that guy knew where Vicky was going to be and caused all this fuss. I wanted to go to the space money place for that whipped cream cup. Max said when we finally got the phone sorted. He means Starbucks for one of those little cups of whipped cream they give to dogs. I explained. Puppuccino. He further corrected. You had like 50 pounds of whipped cream on your waffles already. Vicky said, not following along. It tastes different, different in a cup. cup. We said at the same time. Max brought up a good point. Aside from the Starbucks thing, how did that man know where Vicky was? If he was stalking her, she surely would know. Suddenly, everything came together in my head with a click I thought those two could hear. You used me! I cried, looking at Vicky. Looking around, Vicky found an empty plastic water bottle on the side of the road. Picking it up, she handed it to Max, telling him to go play for a bit. He nodded and tossed the bottle. It flew down the street and he went chasing after it. He was fast enough to catch it before it landed and play fetch with himself. He often did this when we got too bored on jobs. What are you talking about? She hissed after Max left. You knew this guy was dangerous but couldn't do anything about it. You must have heard the rumors of a new human working as a mailman and requested us to be the ones delivering the mail today. You knew Max was going to go out and must have told the guy where we were going. The diner had big windows so he just saw us together the entire time making him more and more pissed off. What I don't understand is why he never mentioned seeing Max with us. Max is invisible to humans. It's because he has those dog ears. Why do you think he makes you order things for him all the time? If that was the case, then no wonder why our waitress gave us such a strange look after ordering so much food and finishing it all. Why would I bother doing all of that? I could just wait until he gave me a reason to eat him. She scoffed at my idea. Because you were worried that he might not go for you first. You're a nice person after all and wanted to not risk another girl's safety. Vicky stared down at me, her face dark, and she seemed a bit taller than before. I took a step back, not knowing what I just got myself into. Those are all theories without any proof. I suggest you never tell anyone of your silly little thoughts. If you do... She grabbed my face with a large clawed hand. Her face remained somewhat normal, but her eyes glowed and mouth looked far too large. In a deep growling voice, she leaned in closer, crushing my jaw with her hand. I'll figure out a way to rip you apart if you start spreading that nonsense. Out of all the things I've seen so far, Vicky was near the top of the list of things I did not want to mess with. The water bottle came flying towards us. We reached out and snatched it from the air, not even looking over. The plastic crackling and crumpling in her grip. I knew that would be the sounds my bones would make if I didn't listen to her. I nodded and she let go, my jaw feeling bruised. Max joined us, unaware of any threats to my life. Vicky left soon after to take care of the mess she left behind in the house. Her face, just then, and watching her kill a man in front of me, would haunt my thoughts for a very long time. Another haunting image from that night was Max's disappointed face when we finally found a Starbucks, and it was closed. 